remotely to the uh, to this workshop uh, city star workshop uh, let me uh, before giving uh, some uh, practical uh, let's say details uh, on the organization of the week it is a pleasure to to have uh, Gert Arts uh, ECT star director uh, remotely connected and so I invite him to to say a few words to us and uh, before starting the scientific program of the workshop. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, oh yeah, so I'm very happy to be here even though it's remotely. Um, I was in Trento two weeks ago for the first hybrid meeting um, and I enjoyed it very much. Um, so this is the second hybrid meeting now. Um, so I'm going to show you a few slides. I'm not going full screen because in this way I can see uh, a little bit better what's going on. So welcome everyone to, to ECT Star. Uh, many of you have been here many times before, of course, um, but it's good to welcome people back um, in person after such a long time. Um, for the few of you who may not be too familiar with ECT Star, um, this uh, slide outlines its, its mission. It's uh, a center to carry out research at the, at the frontier in, uh, in theoretical nuclear physics, and then to promote active contact, context between theory and experiment and other areas of research, and also to train young uh, researchers. And all three activities are, uh, are currently taking place. As you know, ECT STAR has been around for a long time, since 1993. Um, and maybe one important aspect is that it's uh, a community-driven uh, center, so it's the participants uh, who can uh, of workshops like this one who can actively contribute to uh, the program that is running at ECT Star. And as it happened, we're having a scientific board meeting exactly today, and so we're currently determining the program for uh, for 2022. Um, so this is the activities for this year. Um, as you know very well, all activities were online until the end of September, uh, and then two weeks ago we had the first hybrid meeting. Um, with about 10 people in person, so a little bit smaller than, uh, than this one. And, and your meeting is the second hybrid meeting, which is fantastic. Concerning the training, um, over the summer we had two schools running, the talent school and the doctoral training program. Uh, the talent school had as topic machine learning and a doctoral training program, uh, quantum technologies and applications in high energy nuclear physics. Um, and then we also have a visitor program, which is currently on, on hold. Um, until more people attend the uh, uh, can work can work on a daily basis in the in the in the center. Um, we have a Twitter account. I say this in every meeting, so maybe you've you've attended previous meetings online, but we have a Twitter account, so please um, follow us on Twitter. A few words about the related areas. Um, so traditionally, this has been very broad astrophysics, cosmology, particle physics, condensed matter physics, uh, computational physics, etc. And now in recent years, there's an interest in quantum technology, quantum computing and machine learning. Um, and so this is, is covered as well. And there's a relation to nuclear physics actually. So the quantum many body problem or in generally strongly coupled systems uh, might be studied using say, uh, say quantum technology. And so there are many opportunities here for the theoretical nuclear physics community um, as it's traditionally seen. Um, the scientific board, um, so this was the status from uh, a few weeks ago. At today's board meeting, some people have had their last meeting and some people have joined for the first meeting. Um, so this slide will be updated after tomorrow, after today. Um, but what's important is that um, uh, the membership of the board is suggested by ECC star associates and uh, associates are everyone who participates in, in the workshop program or the, or the doctoral training program. Um, and so in this way, you can provide direct input into the uh, steering of the, the center. There's a local research group as well. Um, there are five uh, senior researchers uh, working in nuclear physics and computational physics. Um, a few years ago, there was a, a separation between the activities and uh, this year uh, we've decided to uh, merge them. So there's now five senior researchers and up to last month, there were about uh, 10 postdocs uh, at, at DCT Star, um, working on all kinds of uh, areas. So uh, high energy, essentially QCD, um, 
uh, down to hadron therapy, say, with, with medical applications. So really covering a lot of different areas. Um, just to highlight one uh, news item for a local researcher, so Francesco Celeberti, who's a postdoc um, at the center, who has been awarded a, a gala fellowship uh, related to the uh, electric uh, electron ion collider. And so he will spend six months at JLab in the in the coming year. And it's something we're quite proud of because there are only three postdoctoral research fellowships awarded, and two of them were to researchers in the US. And so Francesco is the only non-US one and, um, and the only European one who's been awarded this fellowship. So that's uh, very well done. Uh, funding, um, as you know, funding comes from various areas, the Bruno Kessler Foundation, the National Funding Agencies, Horizon 2020, individual projects, and here's an overview of the different funding agencies, so the national agencies, the European ones, and the, uh, the German ones as well. Now, this workshop is particularly well funded, uh, so your workshop is supported by EMI, um, and so if you have a publication or an output that is uh, developed or completed or initiated during this workshop, um, you can uh, uh, acknowledge EMI. Similarly, the workshop is supported by Strong 2020. So there's another uh, sentence here which can be included. And finally, the workshop is also supported by the uh, CRC uh, uh, mechanism in, in Germany. So um, I don't know what the sentence is to include for this particular source, but you know very well, of course. Um, and that's it uh, for me. So um, thanks a lot for coming in person or for joining online and uh, enjoy the meeting. For this nice introduction on the activities of the ECT star. So I'm not sure there are questions on this point. So, uh, so thanks and so very warm welcome also from me um, on behalf of all organizers to, to our workshop today. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, have the privilege to chair the first session and I think we should go ahead without further ado. We're running um, only three minutes late. So let's get right into it uh, with uh, Massimo Manarelli from Gran Sasso uh, introducing to us the phase diagram at finite temperature and chemical potential. Hi, everybody. Thanks a lot for uh, the invitation. My apologies for not being there in person. Um, so uh, this is a, an overview talk about um, you know, the possible phases of a droning matter um, at finite temperature and uh, as a function of uh, baryonic chemical potential. And I've added as well as a function of the isospin chemical potential. Here you can find my contact email. So uh, even after the, the conference, feel free to email me. And um, the outline of, uh, of my talk is uh, this one. We will uh, have a first approach to the QCD phase diagram in the next slides. And I briefly discuss the natural labs, which are relevant for the uh, dronic matter in extreme conditions. And um, this will show a richness of the phases. And then we will get back to the QCD phase diagram and uh, see uh, as much uh, progress we can uh, uh, we can do. Um, so the phase diagram, uh, there are things uh, we know, uh, things uh, we know we don't know, and uh, unfortunately also think we don't know we don't know. And uh, but uh, essentially um, there are things uh, that we would like to know that uh, are possibly in reach, and this is a very good uh, news from the theoretical and experimental point uh, uh, of view. So this is a, um, the so-called QCD phase diagram. It's a, a grand canonical description of the possible phases of matter as we change the, the temperature, uh, the baryonic chemical potential. And uh, there is a third axis, which is not usually shown, which is the isospin chemical potential, which tells you the degrees of asymmetry of uh, a matter. The thing is that in general, for a given density, uh, if matter reaches equilibrium, we reach a certain point uh, in the, uh, with the um, isospin uh, chemical potential, as an example in compact stars, we know that there are more, much more neutrons than protons, which means that uh, there is no, it's not isospin symmetric matter. But in any case, uh, um, it's relevant to explore the phase diagram, even uh, uh, without taking into account uh, the realistic condition that can be realized in nature. Uh, also looking to what we can do uh, using uh, heavy ion relativistic heavy ion collisions. And then the thing is that uh, 
um, according to our present knowledge, we know that uh, certainly there is a phase we confined hadrons, which is the one in which uh, we live, and that uh, increasing the temperature, there is a transition to a quark muon plasma where uh, quarks and gluons are uh, liberated. As we increase um, instead the, the bradonic chemical potential, we should reach some more phases, and asymptotically, uh, probably the um, uh, energetically favored phase is the cross conducting phase. And uh, on the new I axis, if we um, have a chemical potential exceeding, exceeding the, 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 the pion mass, we should read the, the pion condensed phase. So we are basically three waves of moving, three directions. No? The first is a heating, maintaining as many baryons as antibaryons, basically done in a relativistic ADI and collision. Then there is a compressing matter, maintaining as many protons as neutrons. So it's isospin symmetric, or we can go in this direction, altering matter, changing the chemical potential, say, uh, looking for a system where there are more neutrons than protons, or more pi plus than pi minus, as an example. So the a bit of, uh, say, historical approach to the QCD phase diagram can be done uh, using going back to the work uh, uh, by uh, Agador. Um, in the 60s, uh, where um, people looking for a thermodynamic description of hadronic matter. And of course, this should include uh, uh, all the possible hadrons. The thing is that uh, there's many of them, as we know, there are mesons and, and, and baryons. These are just uh, the low-lying states. I mean, there's, uh, of, as we know, much more than them than that. And um, before asymptotic freedom, uh, asymptotic freedom is uh, 72, 73. Uh, in the 1973, it's been published uh, the two works on asymptotic freedom. Hagedon suggested the statistical bootstrap idea. is saying that uh, there's a, an exponential growth of states uh, and a limiting in the temperature for a drawing matter. Very roughly, uh, the idea was that uh, if you have uh, more, if you had more, more, en more energy to the system, you will not increase the temperature. You increase the number of particles you have there. In this view, uh, there was a, uh, an obvious caveat, uh, was that the particles are not uh, point-like. And this was already noticed uh, uh, in 1951 by, by Pomerantio, suggesting that uh, uh, to have an hadron, you, have, you must have enough volume for, uh, for an hadron. Otherwise, uh, uh, this uh, structure should somehow reveal. And this was uh, discussed by um, Khabib in Paris, yeah, an almost Nobel Prize and the Nobel Prize, uh, who suggested that uh, uh, the exponential growth of uh, states is actually uh, um, uh, an indication of a possible phase transition to a deconfined phase. And this is actually the, 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 phase, the QCD phase diagram shown in their seminal work. 1975 is uh, after asymptotic freedom. And indeed, I mean, uh, uh, they uh, were saying that uh, for sufficiently high uh, temperature or baryonic density, there should be a, a second order phase transition from phase one, which is confined, to phase two, which is a, a deconfined phase. They were treating the system in the infinite volume limit because all, only in that case, you can really see a second order phase transition. Somehow, uh, to reconcile the two, the two things, we can say that uh, closer to the phase transition, second order phase transition, there's a kind of a, a critical opalescence of hadrons. I mean, there's a, a second order phase transition is characterized by fluctuations uh, at any length scale. And this is uh, somehow uh, translated in our description of droning matter, saying that there are hadrons of any mass close to the second order phase transition. So the important idea, important lesson for this, is that the close to TC, hadronic resonances play a crucial role. If, but if you insist to treat the uh, hadronic matter uh, above TC as made by baryons and only made by baryons and mesons, you will have uh, an inconsistent description because TC is its limit in temperature, which Agadon uh, Say it was of order m pi, which not uh, not not that far from uh, the accepted value, and the pressure of the bootstrap and also the energy density actually of the bootstrap statistical model is in agreement with lattice QCD below uh, uh, the critical temperature. You can find, I mean, a nice uh, uh, a nice paper on, uh, on with all of this idea in a paper by Frederick and Satz of a uh, few years ago. So what is uh, the state, I mean, the, the, the roughly the, the idea of what happens to matter as we increase density? So in this, uh, uh, on, on the left, you find uh, 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 the, the possible states of matter. 
so uh, hydrogen, helium, iron, and then uh, you have uh, uh, the density of, uh, of matter. Uh, this is um, the third column, will be clear in, uh, in a few slides. It's uh, associated with uh, the part of uh, a neutron star. Uh, the third describes uh, the strong coupling and uh, alpha s. And, uh, uh, and the last column is the <laughs> degrees of freedom. So as we increase the density, say from hydrogen to iron, we have a description in terms of nuclei, atoms and nuclei. This is a part of the atmosphere and then of the outer crust of neutron star. In this case, the, the strong coupling is, um, is a confining, so uh, we cannot learn much about the uh, alpha S in this, in this regime. But uh, as we go inside the, uh, at, at larger densities, we have a phase which, in which neutrons are liberated. There is a, a point in which we reach uh, the saturation density of nuclear matter. And then uh, a so-called, I mean, let me call it a quark trip in an energy with the neutron drip and the formation of a soup of quarks and gluons. The important thing is that, uh, so here we have nuclei, here we have neutrons and protons, and then uh, there's a part of the, this uh, um, qualitative diagram in which uh, basically we don't know what we have in the sense that uh, uh, at high density we have a, a quarkionic matter, maybe we have Cooper pairs or uh, it's uh, uh, formation of, uh, and probably globos play an important role, instantons, et cetera. It's only asymptotically, uh, we have a description in terms of quarks and gluons. And this goes back to, the, to what we said before. I mean, before reaching this, we have to pass uh, an area, a region, in which actually it's uh, not so obvious what, is the, what are the, the, the relevant degrees of freedom. So what are the methods we can, uh, we can use um, to study this gram? Um, certainly, um, at asymptotic uh, energy scales, we have a pu um, perturbative QCD, like uh, by this, I mean, um, uh, hard thermal loop, hard density loop, non-relativistic QCD, and so forth, and so on. There's really many uh, uh, development methods uh, as a perturbative, uh, coming from perturbative QCD. Then there are a um, realization in which you are only use the global properties of QCD, the global symmetries, which is a, a kind of perturbation theory like uh, theories. This is uh, roughly, very roughly, mm -hmm. the region of, uh, of interest. And then there are lattice QCD methods. And today you will have a talk by uh, Christian Schmidt about, um, uh, about this. And then, then there are uh, angel like uh, models in which you replace uh, gluons with the contact like interaction. I will show. Um, uh, next slide, what are NJ-like uh, models? Might be uh, supplemented by Polyakov loop. Oh, uh, these are not really strict categories. As an example, there, is a, uh, there are various approaches which mix um, uh, LQCD simulations with effective field theories. As an example, a very known example is carrier perturbation theory, which we have the low energy constants, which can be determined by lattice QCD simulation, but also approaches in which one uses the potential extracted from lattice QCD to run um, like a, a T matrix approaches and so on. So it's, it's not really, the, these are not the rigid uh, the, uh, definition in the sense that, of course, you, one can use some more methods, like uh, there's a quark meson method. At a certain point, I was thinking to, 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 to present here all of, these, uh, per, uh, all of these approaches, of the effective field theory approaches, but uh, uh, it would be an endless talk because there are so many of them and one I really can only focus on one or two of them. But the general idea is that uh, uh, when we work with defective field theories, we have uh, two possible perspectives. So there are many different approaches, but uh, the two, I mean, maybe we can uh, uh, disentangle them in those uh, which uh, produce, uh, say, um, a model which, uh, which is useful to understand physical phenomena, um, re say, related to, uh, to, uh, uh, to large chemical potentials or large temperatures and others which are um, uh, related to understanding QCD, uh, in a region in which the correct degrees of freedom are quotes and gluons. This is a, a broad definition, since that there are many effective field theories which are in between. But um, the use uh, that people do of this it can be really different. I mean, if, he, if I'm interested in, uh, say, a description of uh, um, um, a neutron star, maybe it's for some of them, it's enough to use a, say, um, a polytropic like equation of state, which is more or less physically motivated from uh, QCD. But uh, this does not 
help much to, to, to understand QCD because there's no uh, direct link of this equation of state to, um, uh, to QCD. On the other hand, there are other approaches like uh, perturbative QCD, which are obtained directly from QCD in a very specific limit. So, of course, they are not mutually exclusive. Uh, but uh, I mean, there are, there's two uh, different approaches to them. Both of them, in my opinion, are useful, and both of them can uh, shed light on the on the QCD phase diagram in some in, um, in some sense. So, what are the, the natural labs where uh, hydronic matter can be proved? So, as my uh, daughter says, I'm a, a vintage guy. So, uh, I took this from a Fermi lab actually more than 20 years ago, 1989. So, it's a it's a it's an old uh, picture than. Uh, um, my people's Fermilab, which is the, um, about the history of the uh, of the universe, and then basically um, it tells us uh, the state of matter uh, from the Big Bang on. Um, the the important thing is that uh, somehow people tend to say that uh, in a, a heavy ion collision, is uh, the, the the universe has been uh, uh, the state of universe has been reproduced uh, when it was like a, a microsecond old, um, but. Uh, there are things which one should always keep in mind. The first certainly is that uh, the evolution of the universe is determined by Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker cosmology. So uh, in particular, there's an equation which tells us how the uh, um, uh, universe is expanding. And uh, the energy density and the pressure certainly enter in this description, but uh, the, the expansion itself is not uh, uh, governed by, is not like the, Q, uh, the QGP expansion at all. And the other thing is that the core cap is at about 10 to the minus six seconds, whereas the, 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 the QGP lasts few Fermi over C. So it's uh, 10 to the minus 23 seconds. And this also is, a, is an important difference because a microsecond is a very, very long time scheme as compared to the 17 orders of difference between the, the core cap of the time and the QGP typical time. Finally, the universe is quite homogeneous. It's uh, like uh, uh, fluctuation temperatures are uh, order 10 to the minus three. So it's very, very tiny. And there's uh, also an interesting, uh, I don't know whether you can see it actually. Okay, there's an interesting uh, um, uh, review by Rafalski of maybe a few years ago about uh, the, the difference between the early universe and the QGP. The other natural lab is of course, uh, are of course neutral stars, uh, in general compact stars. This is also quite old. Uh, um, drawing by uh, Friedrich Weber. Uh, and these are objects where there's an extremely like uh, baryonic density in the interior because they are objects of the order of the solar mass in a radius of 10 kilometers. The temperature is low. I mean, it's 10 to the six, it's a 1 million Kelvin. This is uh, um, more than the temperature of, of the surface of the, of the sun. In the interior of the sun, we have around about 10 to the seven Kelvin. So it sounds really cold object, but the baryonic chemical potential is so large that we, in many uh, studies, we can uh, uh, basically um, neglect the temperature effects. And the, as you, the, 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 in this drawing, you see that there are uh, different arrows pointing in different directions. And the, the, the point is that apart from the, the external part, which is the, the, the crust, uh, there is a uh, little knowledge on what is happening inside. Um, certainly, uh, we reach um, densities larger than the, the, the critical temperature, than the, sorry, than the, 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 than the saturation density of, uh, of uh, nuclear matter. So we expect that there could be some uh, quark trip inside, and this is uh, exactly this uh, this arrow here, which is called uh, a quark hybrid star. And instead, this is the, the traditional neutron star, where you only have a neutron, protons, electrons, and muons inside. But there are other possibilities which have not been completely ruled out. Uh, there are some indications that it's very hard to have this and these uh, faces here. And this is a, a completely different kind of object, a strange star, which is a, a self-bound object. So it's not bound by gravity, but it's bound by the strong interaction itself. Uh, the thing is that uh, if you observe the object from outside, it's very difficult to, to, to see, I mean, what it has in the interior. Uh, fortunately, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, in the merging processes, uh, some indication on the possible phases which can which are arising inside uh, have been given. Um, but the question now is: Is this accessible on Earth? Can we produce neutron-rich matter? Um, 
So the, the, the answer is in part, yes. This is a, a, uh, these are some isotopes that can uh, be found in the outer part of a neutral star. And this uh, double line here is, uh, well, this is a 1994, it's that things have been changed during year, but uh, this gives you the idea that uh, basically we can uh, reach, uh, we can go from iron to zirconium. This is the point where experimental uh, inputs stops. And this is instead a result of numerical calculation. And as you can see, there is a, a trend in the reduction of zeta over A, telling us that this is actually isospin um, asymmetric matter. And also there's another important thing, which is the fact that uh, um, at, uh, uh, there's a point where there is the drip of neutrons, which is this, uh, this point here, uh, corresponding to a pretty high uh, electron chemical potential. Uh, in the interior, I mean, if you in keep increasing density, you should reach something like zeta over A of order uh, 110. And um, uh, it should consider the fact that there are many electrons. So uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, uh, it's very hard to produce this condition, okay? Uh, in a nature labs, in a, in a, in an artificial lab, okay. So the, the conditions which are realized in nature are very peculiar of that particular object that uh, is in the sky. Um, this is another uh, very old one. Uh, I'm an old-fashioned guy, so I, but, but that's because I really love this uh, paper by Nagle Botanin of 1973, where they've shown uh, the distribution of neutrons and protons. As we uh, get, as we go inside a, um, a neutron star, so basically they are very. Uh, these are uh, two nuclei. Uh, there is a distribution of neutrons and protons. As we squeeze matter, then uh, some uh, uh, neutrons come out of the of the of uh, uh, the cloud around the, uh, about this cloud here, and they form a continuum of states here. And uh, yeah, when you reach selenium, I mean, it's one thousand eight hundred nucleons. And then uh, you go to your conium and your manium. Of course, uh, these are not, uh, uh, it, it's very hard to think that you can reproduce this kind of objects on the, on the earth and this kind of, uh, um, of, of, uh, uh, of state of matter where you have the drip of neutrons, when neutrons uh, form a continuum uh, outside nuclei. Okay, so um, let's get back to the, to the fundamental theory, which is uh, quantum chromodynamics is a, a D missing here. Um, it's, a, uh, as we know, it's a theory, which is a, uh, the one which we should use to build uh, the QCD phase diagram. And it's a, a theory made of um, uh, six um, uh, fermionic, um, six, six fermions, which are the, the, the quarks and uh, eight gluons. So it's a, um, in the adjoint uh, representation of color. It's a, uh, it has a typical energy scale, which is a, a 200 QCD, which is the scale at which uh, the, the strong interaction becomes, uh, uh, the, 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 the alpha S becomes of order, of order one. Um, here you can see that uh, there's a, a growing of, uh, of uh, uh, the interaction at uh, uh, large distances and uh, uh, small energies and uh, uh, producing confinement. And then uh, there is a, a reduction, a asymptotic freedom at very short distances of very high energy scales. Um, the thing is that uh, uh, this is, uh, as we know, I mean, from the study of beta function, this is a logarithmic dependence. So it means that it really needs a lot of, of energy to reach um, the perturbative. Indeed, uh, at uh, the mass of the zeta, alpha is the order 0.1. So it's, a, it's very hard to use, uh, uh, to use QCD, but the, the important thing is that there are two limits which are pretty well understood. The one which is at m equals zero and m to infinity. m equals zero corresponds, to, say, for uh, taking just up, down a strange quark to three flavor massless quark matter, which has uh, this symmetry. I mean, I'm not, I will not talk about U1 axiom. Um, which is SU3 colors, there's a, which is the gauge group. Um, so it's a, uh, the one which characterizes the kind of interaction between uh, quarks uh, and gluons. There's a co global chiral symmetry and the global baryonic number. On the, on the other hand, for M to infinity, uh, there's not, there are no uh, dynamical quarks. So it's uh, a pure uh, young mill theory. And we have a, a very uh, well-defined object, which is the Polyakov loop, to define uh, uh, the kind of phase we have. And the expectation value of the Polyakov loop gives uh, basically the free energy of uh, uh, putting uh, um, the quarks in your, in your system. So chiral symmetry amounts to rotate independently left and right-handed quark fields. 
And this rotation can be locked by the a condensate of psi bar psi condensate. So it's a condensate of quark and antiquark. On the other hand, uh, the Polakov loop is gauge invariant, but it's sensitive to the symmetry called the center symmetry. And it tells you that uh, basically it acquires a phase as an effect of the, of the center symmetry. So at low t, chiral symmetry is broken. Psi bar psi is different from zero. So there's the locking of SU3 left times SU3 right in the vectorial part. At high t, the chiral symmetry holds. So with an ordered parameter, we can distinguish the two phases. The same holds at m to infinity. The center symmetry holds L equals zero at low t. At high t, L is the, uh, different from zero. The center symmetry is broken. So we have an ordered parameter as well. The point is that these are correct uh, degrees of freedom. These are correct uh, order parameters in this uh, well-defined limit. But QCD stands in, the, in between. So we have a, a pseudo-critical temporal, QD and T chi. Uh, the, one, the first is uh, the confinement. The second one is uh, chiral symmetry. And um, there's no, in principle, any reason uh, why the two should be the same. Uh, the Polakov loop is related to quark confinement, not to gluon confinement. So it's a kind of weird thing that uh, in a theory with no dynamical quarks, the Polakov loop uh, is related to confinement of quarks. Okay, so it kind of, uh, but that's because you assume there are external charges, external quarks put in your, in your system. There's no fundamental reason why TD and TK should be the same, but uh, um, there are uh, many indications that it actually, it is, they are at least very, very similar. And uh, roughly speaking, it's because uh, of lambda QCD, which is the only basically scale uh, relevant in, um, in, uh, in QCD. And it's natural to expect that both uh, should be um, uh, around the lambda QCD. So apart from these theory group arguments, um, we should have a, a phenomenological description of confinement and chiral symmetry breaking. Because uh, in our world, uh, is not the one with m equals 0 or m to, m to infinity. So heating, compressing, or altering. I mean, we can heat matter to see what happens. We can uh, squeeze it, or we can uh, um, imagine to alter its uh, composition. If you have, uh, if you have theories, fortunately, you can do it that, uh, uh, as we wish. Uh, and uh, in part, this is also possible in, uh, uh, in lattice QCD simulations. And uh, in, uh, in part also possible in uh, uh, um, heavy ion collision, as we can uh, probe the states of matter at different mu b and mu i. So the hadronic phase. Um, some remarks on this uh, on this phase, um, also because uh, sometimes um, uh, there's confusion on this. Basically, uh, um, uh, the basic classification of uh, confined hadrons is in baryons and mesons. Um, baryons are very uh, tough guys in the sense that uh, their mass is 1 GV is much larger than their, uh, the mass of uh, up and down quarks. And there, uh, the range is of order uh, 1 Fermi. On the other hand, we have uh, mesons, which are pions, which also have a mass, um, uh, typically pions of uh, 135, 140 mV, which is much larger than uh, the mass of uh, up and down quarks. But they can be understood as a, a num kind of uh, arising from chiral symmetry breaking. And then we have, among mesons, heavy mesons. So we should distinguish pions and heavy mesons. So baryons are, uh, uh, in the infrared, are blob of gluons. I mean, the, the PDF is dominated by, uh, by, by gluons. Uh, and uh, mm, so there, there are three charges, which are the three valence quarks, which have uh, some, come out embedded in a blob of gluons. It's not a bound state of quarks at all. As you can, it's uh, because of the, 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 the up, the down quarks are much smaller than the mass of the, of the object. It's rather um, useful to describe it as kirmion, a soliton, or in any case, a non-perturbative object. On the other hand, we have mesons, okay, and among them we have the pions, which are which can be understood as a, a number goldstone bosons, or pseudo number goldstone bosons. Finally, non-relativistic objects as um, heavy mesons. Let me focus a bit on this double role of uh, mesons. So pions uh, are the three number of bosons associated to the breaking of, uh, say, SU2 le S2 left times SU2 right uh, in the vectorial part. Okay, um, And so these are the three Goldstone bosons associated to this uh, symmetry locking. 
Um, uh, they were, um, they are pseudo because, uh, I mean, if you consider um, uh, the non vanishing mass for up and down quark. But um, uh, on the other end, we have heavy masses, which have a, um, a completely different uh, um, origin, in the sense that we can really describe them as bound state of, uh, um, of a quark and anti quark pair. Because uh, the mass of this object, like uh, J psi, et cetera, are, is less than the mass of the two heavy quarks that participate in it. So a, um, uh, even if both of uh, uh, mesons, they really play a different role. And QCD uh, manifests itself in a different way in these two uh, kind of mesons. This is uh, true, especially when you look at the quark room plasma. Um, in this case, we have the confinement by increasing the temperature. So uh, basically, we have a system in which we are pumping energy. What happens is that there are scattering, and this scattering produces more and more particles and antiparticles. So baryons, baryons, mesons, etc. At certain point, we have a kind of saturation, and we expect the transition. We expect the transition to a state in which uh, uh, the individual, the, the, the real plasma of quarks uh, and gluons because individual nucleons have lost their, uh, their identity. So as uh, Pomeranchi would say, uh, to, to, to have, a, to have a, a baryon, uh, a proton, you need a, a, a finite volume. Uh, otherwise, it's not a proton. It's something different. And so what are the, the, the good probes for it? I mean, I will focus only on, the, uh, on the, uh, a few of them, actually, mostly on the heavy quarconia. So this is a, um, some, it can be described as a dual superconductor in the sense that, that uh, the field is uh, all in between the Q and Q bar pair. It is a bound state, so I was we saying before. And uh, uh, some decay channels are uh, already suppressed. This is important because uh, this um, uh, is important because uh, it, there's, there are clear signal then in uh, say dilepton, uh, et cetera. And especially for J side, it cannot, uh, um, a decay in open charm, um, in, at least, uh, um, uh, well, that, that actually can change with temperature, but at least in vacuum cannot decay in open charm because there's no phase, uh, phase space. And uh, very important, it can be described a very, very simple motor like the Cornell potential, which is uh, uh, written here, which gives uh, a semi quantitative description of this uh, state, a very, say, uh, good description of it. So increasing the temperature of the chemical potential, the quark can dissociate by the combination of two, diff of two effects, basically. Um, the device screening of Landau damping. There will be many talks on this, on the lepton signals uh, uh, on, uh, on Tuesday. And there will be also talks about uh, uh, this in uh, device screening and, uh, and uh, Landau damping. But let me briefly uh, say what is, uh, how can we describe it? So uh, if you take a, say, um, a quark anti quark pair, it is a radius of, say, half Fermi or something like that. And uh, if we increase the temperature, uh, we will have uh, mesons uh, or if we, in, uh, in, in our system. So uh, as uh, Agedon was saying, proliferation of state close to, close to TC, we can also put some baryons, uh, increasing the baryonic chemical potential around it. But this has uh, basically no effect on the, on the QQ bar state. And the reason is that uh, in this figure, the, 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 the sizes are wrong. The recurrent sizing is this one. So this is a very tight bound state, uh, very small, half Fermi, uh, so less than one, uh, one Fermi of a baryon, which simply doesn't feel uh, the, the, the variation of, uh, of, well, almost that doesn't feel the variation of the, of the system around it. At a certain point, the temperature will cross the, the, the critical temperature, and there will be some uh, device screening, meaning that the potential now has a screening part. It's not only uh, a Coulomb one, but there's also a uh, device screening of the of interaction. At a certain point, uh, the, the temperature will be so high uh, above uh, the, the um, a dissociation temperature, and then uh, we will have a quark and anti-quark pair. This can also be, this was a uh, seminal work by Matsu and Satz in 1986. But uh, this has also been studied recently as a, a function of uh, baryonic chemical potential, which of course has a very similar effect because we are putting stuff inside uh, our system. At a certain point, there will be um, overlap between uh, our nucleons and uh, the typical distance between them will be less 
than uh, this uh, 0 0.5 Fermi. So it's a, a certain point that this, uh, this state should dissociate or increasing temperature or increasing the, uh, the chemical potential or increasing both of them. And the, the other possibility is that there is Landau damping. And um, the basic idea is very simple here. Uh, any, any state uh, doesn't live forever in a thermal bath because uh, there will be always uh, some particle which has a very high energy in the tail of a, a Boltzmann distribution function, which is very high energy to, to break uh, the QQ bar pair. So this will uh, uh, sooner or later happen. This means that there's, the, uh, there's a weight which we have to associate the thermal width that we have to associate with the, the state. So even turning off strong and weak interaction, uh, only for the fact that there is a, so the, the, sorry, the potential among them, even, um, even, even, if we, even if we turn off uh, any other effect, the, the effect in the bath that simply will destroy this, uh, uh, this system. And this was a study in 2007 by Mick Colleen and collaborators, and there's been a, a very big activity in this. But it, it goes back to old ideas of a photo dissociation uh, of molecules in a, in a heat bath. So you have a molecule of oxygen, it is a heat by a photon, it dissociates into, um, uh, into atoms of oxygen. So it's very uh, nice and, uh, and of course, both uh, now damping and, uh, and um, uh, the device screening can uh, work at the same time. And there's uh, uh, probably they are, they are in, uh, the device screening, the damping is more important, at least if we believe in the results obtained by a non-relativistic QCD and the thermal loop, the now damping seems to be the dominant mechanism for dissociation at uh, a small uh, uh, chemical potential. And then uh, the other probes, important probes, is simply an AV core produced, the say, in uh, at the beginning uh, uh, of the, the collision, which while propagates uh, while propagating the quark gluon plasma, um, uh, encounters an, uh, a quark or an anti quark, uh, does a, a resonance scattering, say, in a D meson like uh, state, and then decays away. And this, of course, uh, uh, is uh, it's very important if you study transport properties of, uh, of, uh, of the system, because it tells us uh, how the, the, the promptly generated heavy quark fills the medium which is uh, expanding. And uh, if you substitute the, the, the U bar with the, um, the C bar, you have a kind of um, a phenomenon in which you have a, a generation of uh, 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 heavy quarks, uh, heavy quarkonia, um, uh, and it was studied by two and co-workers in the 2000, 2001. So there's a rich phenomenology, and all of this is related with the, uh, uh, with the dynamics of the, the quarkon plasma. So, um, how much time do I have? Um, there you go. Oh, I cannot hear you, I'm sorry. Okay, no, I cannot hear you. Anyway, I, I go ahead. <laughs> so, color superconductor is another of possible phases which can be realized at a very high baryonic chemical potential. Uh, really, really a cartoon. Um, uh, quarks are um, uh, point-like objects. When they're uh, combined in a baryon, they form an object which is a world of one Fermi, but they can also form uh, a correlated dipork states uh, in the confined matter of order 10 Fermi. And this is um, uh, what can happen in the inner core of compact star. So there is a liquid of quarks, uh, which, uh, uh, in which there is a correlation of pairs, which is larger than the typical distance uh, between quarks. This is a, a BCS-like um, state. Uh, uh, in which we have um, uh, the, the transition to um, um, a, a superconducting or superfluid phase. Perturbatively, uh, this is uh, driven by one gluon exchange. So it's a, um, a, a syntotic uh, density. There is a, a channel in which the exchange of gluon is attracted. So this is a, uh, um, uh, this is able to produce a, a correlated uh, uh, dipole pair. Um, in this case, uh, however, uh, if we want to, to see what, what is the effect uh, of this phase in, uh, inside the quark star, uh, we, can, uh, um, we can use an NJ-like model. So one of the models was presenting at the beginning. These are models in which you replace the, um, uh, the, 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 the interaction mediated by gluons by a contact interaction, pretty much as in the Fermi theory uh, of weak interactions. And in this case, however, you have to keep into account there's a 
there's a spin color and a flavor structure which is um, uh, relevant in the uh, in the interaction. And uh, um, uh, when you use uh, this, you can actually compute a free energy. You can compute a, uh, so uh, find out which is the favorite phase. And uh, the, the the good thing is that uh, using this uh, this model in a, at asymptotic uh, scales, you find that actually. Uh, there's a favorite, uh, uh, it is favorite the correlation, formation of correlation between quarks. And um, uh, in general, they have uh, this uh, structure here. So it's a side size, so it's, it breaks um, the gauge symmetry. It is a, a color charge and uh, a condensate which has a, a typical color and a flavor structure. So it's anti-symmetric in color because it's a three bar channel. In order to have a spin zero, which is the favorite uh, uh, interaction channel, you have also have an anti-symmetry in, um, in flavor indices. And then, um, um, the, the, the color symmetry, the, the, the flavor and the uh, baryonic uh, charge symmetry, all of them can be broken, locked or mixed. So there's a really, um, there's really many different phases um, uh, which, can be, which can be realized. Probably the most famous one is the color flavor locked phase in which uh, we have a pairing of um, uh, quarks uh, of all flavors and colors. It was proposed in 1999 by Alfa, Rajagopal and Vilcek. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, you have uh, the, the, the locking of SC3 color left and right in uh, uh, the diagonal part. So it's a global uh, symmetry. And uh, U1 is broken to the, to the center. Um, is um, uh, in, this symmetry breaking is associated to the, um, uh, so by the X mechanism, eight gauge bonds uh, um, become massive. And uh, there are eight uh, pseudo number Boston bosons. This is pretty much as in the dronic phase where we have pions and canons and beta. Okay, so it's a, uh, and this is uh, at the origin of the uh, quark hadron continuity hypothesis by Schaeffer and Vilcek uh, that there is no phase transition between, uh, no real phase transition between uh, a confined dronic matter and color superconducting matter. And you also have an additional degree of freedom, which is really a superfluid mode uh, associated to the breaking of U1. Finally, um, in this tour, uh, let me let me show um, the meson condensed phase. This is a, a very, I mean, also in this case, it will be just a qualitative view. But the, the idea is roughly the, the following: we know that the pions decay in uh, in muons, uh, okay, in, in general, in leptons um, uh, by uh, by weak processes. Uh, but any decay of pion in um, in muons, uh, well, it, it gives muons because of elicity, but let me just say in, in any in any uh, uh, light fermion, uh, like uh, an electron and muons, it doesn't really change much, I think. As we increase uh, the, 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 the chemical potential of, uh, uh, of the leptons, um, basically we have the Pauli blocking in the sense that uh, when uh, the, the, the chemical potential of the lepton will be equal to the pion mass, to the pion mass, there's no more free space available for uh, for the, the for the decay. So it's Pauli blocked, and uh, we have seen before that actually uh, we, we expect a large electron chemical potential inside the neutron stars. But the important thing is that if you look at the spectrum of pions, there's a, um, uh, there can be a point in which mu i is equal to m pi. And in this case, the effective mass uh, becomes zero. So there is a massless mode, and this is associated to the non-vanishing value of these order parameters, which is a psi bar psi, psi condensate, but uh, with a peculiar uh, sigma two structure in isospin space. So it has a is a pi plus or a pi minus uh, condensate depending on uh, uh, the sign of mu i. And this is a, a, the phase diagram, which has been obtained by color perturbation theory, but also from um, uh, lattice QCD simulation. And um, uh, as a function of mu i, but also as a function of mu s. So we have a first order phase transition with this competition between pi plus and chi plus condensates. But if you move in this direction, we have a second order phase transition between the normal phase and the pi and condensed phase. And very interesting, there is a phase diagram which has been obtained. Uh, by lattice QCD simulation and by a color perturbation theory, NGL model, et cetera, in which um, we have a, a chiral crossover at small mu i, and we have a, a phase transition here, which is a most probably also second order phase transition. It is a pseudo critical point here. So the phase time, let's go back to the phase time. Uh, last look, uh, I'm done, I'm done. 
I cannot hear you, but I'm done, okay? <laughs> so we can uh, uh, basically characterize the faces by uh, different condensates, okay? And we can imagine a tour in the phase diagram following different uh, uh, directions, okay? In this case, we will have some symmetry breaking. So we expect, uh, at least in some limit, to have uh, some phase transition. And actually, we have, uh, we have seen one of these phase transition. We've seen it in the sense that uh, we have uh, numerically studied it, uh, which is precisely the one associated with the red and the green lines here. It is associated with spontaneous symmetry breaking when mu i is larger than m and pi. So the, going back to the phase diagram, we expect something like this, okay? So this is um, uh, the crossover part, which is obtained at uh, mu b equals zero and it has increasing temperature, but also in this direction here, with increasing temperature as of, uh, at the non-vanishing mu i, but vanishing mu b. So very likely there is a region here, which is a crossover region, which extends in mu i, m, uh, mu, I mu b plane. Okay, here we have a second order phase transition, which is exactly this part here. So this is a crossover, a small mu i, which is this part here. And we have a second order phase transition here, which is in this part here. And we also here, it is a second order phase transition line. Now the point is, how is this related to color conducting phase? And how is this related to this line here? Okay, if this line uh, exists, it's, uh, it's still uh, not uh, known. And the, the other important thing is that actually you see here is psi by psi, which is different from zero. And here, both of them are different from zero. Okay, so it's a, there's a rotation of the condensate in isospin space. And uh, if we follow the uh, Adron, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the suggestion of Schaffer and, uh, and, uh, and Vilcek, it may also be that it's kind of a rotation between these two condensates. The naive expectation would be that there's a competition between these two condensates and this is a first order free transition. But uh, it can also happen that you have something like this, a rotation, because here the low energy degrees of freedom here and here are the same, okay? We have uh, eight number of and bosons which are rotated, however, okay? So the, the pions which are on the left are not the, 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 are, uh, are not the pions which uh, you have on the right. They are somehow mixed among, among them. Okay, I'm done and uh, these are my conclusions. To, um, and uh, remember that the kind of symmetry and core confined pertain to two different limits of QCD. And uh, um, however, they should be approximately realized in real QCD. In my opinion, any physical tool, any direction you can take in the QCD phase diagram is uh, um, uh, useful to, sh to shed light on the properties of uh, uh, quantum chromodynamics. Okay, thanks for your attention. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot hear you. <laughs> You're not here? Okay, so I'll oh, deal with no, the question. No, no, we can. Thanks, Ralph. Thanks. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Massimo. Um, so let me first check for questions here in the audience. Uh, ask your question into the microphone. It's maybe a naive curiosity. I was triggered by your point that the size of the die quark is 10 Fermi, uh, which is uh, a large number, in my opinion. And I was wondering if this has implications, now I'm an experimentalist, so I ask a question, experimentalist, on the production of bions in a hadronic environment with respect to a QGP environment. Yeah. Well, there have been, um, so the, uh, the question is uh, whether at finite temperature, uh, this can be some observable uh, or uh, uh, interesting object, if I understand correctly, right? Uh, you're interested in finite temperature. Uh, measurement, no, well, that's, uh, uh, well, there have, been, there have been some studies. I mean, there have been some theoretical studies on the possible formation of uh, correlated pairs, okay? But, um, uh, this is really um, 
I would say model dependent in the sense that there are there have been some models in which these have been uh, have been studied correlated pairs, um, but whether you can really measure them, um, I don't think so. Since we are a little uh, over time already, um, I asked to um, post any more questions you might have on the on the uh, web page that uh, Enrico uh, generated. Let's uh, thank Massimo uh, very much again for this very nice overview. Thanks a lot. And move on to the next talk by uh, Simon Harabash on uh, measurements from Hardis and how they can inform us on the phase diagram, right? Me, Philippe, thank you, Tatiana, for uh, computing stuff. And uh, I would also like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and inviting me to present you uh, Hades results uh, in heavy ion collisions at this uh, collision energy of around uh, two and a half uh, GeV square root of S. And I will start with saying that uh, details of what happen what's happening in heavy ion collisions depends to an extent on exact values of temperature and mu b, and also to an extent they could be uh, controlled by the collision energy. And in this representation of only two dimensions of phase diagram temperature and mu b, uh, you can uh, localize different experiments by uh, these points, which are uh, feeds to statistical hadronization model uh, and uh, and uh, it is not shown in the plot, but uh, different uh, collision energies arrange themselves from here in the phase diagram uh, at the top energies to here uh, where uh, Hades operates. Of course, not all these data points are coming from Hades, but I just highlighted uh, the, uh, the, the range. So uh, we have a program of heavy ions uh, studying I need to interrupt you because we have a message. You that, see this? Yes, that we are in the not the right mode. So, but which one would be here for? No. Look. Want to have um, to to. We have to pick up what from the beginning and also from Karen. slide is something what is seeing on the zoom yeah yeah so and um, can we remove it that was the question like okay. this yes <laughs> okay i don't know if it solved the problem but studying uh, heavy ion collisions at high mu b concentrating mainly 
on uh, rare and penetrating probes, uh, but also we have a program with uh, elementary collisions with pion beams and proton beams. But now today I will focus in my talk mainly on uh, heavy ions. And the results are also, of course, uh, uh, coming from the effort of the whole collaboration uh, here shown in the uh, so group photo of some of the members uh, in the last meeting which uh, took place before the lockdown. Uh, and now the data are collected with uh, this apparatus. And I will highlight also because of the time limits only the fact that it is a typical uh, fixed target setup with high acceptance located in the region where the particles are emitted in the in this fixed target experiment. And also that it is high, it has high interaction rate. So uh, here is a summary of uh, interaction rates versus collision energy for different experiments existing and coming up in the future. And Hades uh, will be beaten up in terms of interaction rate, but only uh, in the future experiments. So now it is still kind of world record. Uh, and with this interaction rate, we are collecting enough data, enough to be able to first of all sort out the events according to uh, centrality. Also to reconstruct the interaction point with high precision. So we can see uh, we are having uh, some slices of the target and also with high precision to uh, uh, identify particles using different observables provided by the detector. And here on the plot is just one example of them uh, of useful observables, velocity, particle velocity versus momentum. So with this precision of data, we can study rare and penetrating probes, uh, among them uh, electromagnetic probes, which do not undergo strong interaction uh, so they are emitted in all phases of uh, heavy ion collisions, as, as shown uh, schematically in this uh, in this space-time diagram, and they all uh, contribute to the spectra. So, like spectrum uh, of invariant mass shown here of of e plus e minus pairs, uh, and uh, in this spectrum, the the contribution from hot and dense medium is included, is contained. Uh, so one can access it by subtracting uh, contribution from initial nucleon nucleon collisions and also uh, from the freeze out. Uh, we have uh, techniques to do that, and this is how this is look like in uh, gold gold collisions. Uh, and it can be described on the theory side by this uh, famous uh, production rate formula. And if we assume that this exponential shape, which you see in the spectrum, is mainly driven by the Boltzmann factor, then you can make a fit and extract and extract the temperature. But also to understand the spectra uh, in more detail, uh, you can uh, compare it to different models, and then you are uh, coming to studying the spectral function of of uh, so to say sources of the radiation and you can see first that uh, uh, vacuum rho fails badly to describe the data and if you include medium effects then uh, it, it comes much better and the closest to the data are those uh, calculations which include uh, coarse graining uh, so assuming local thermal equilibrium so it looks like uh, rho uh, in the data is really uh, melted in the medium but also one has to mention the recent results from Gizem BUU group, which also came closer to description of the data by uh, properly parameterizing uh, proton neutro, uh, neutron uh, bremsstrahlung. Uh, now also then you see, you could see from this previous slide that probably more data is needed to better constrain the model. And for that, uh, Hades collected uh, in 2019, in March, silver-silver uh, uh, collision data. Uh, but before also, we upgraded our ring imaging Cherenkov detector to have uh, better precision, uh, better efficiency of this detector. So now we can see that the efficiency is so good that you can uh, even uh, by eye directly find this Cherenkov light rings in the event display. But not only that, uh, it also allows us to uh, apply sophisticated uh, uh, data analysis of the ring patterns 
which then allows to suppress combinatorial background uh, by a factor of at least uh, at least five. Uh, so now we can do multi-differential analysis with ha such high precision data and low background. Uh, for example, here is a dilepton invariant mass split it into two. Uh, actually, it is split it into three uh, dilepton momentum ranges. I, I selected only two, two figures for the slide, uh, low and, and high. And you can see at high, uh, high momentum, the peaks, which correspond especially to omega, but also to phi, are clearly seen. And this is allowing uh, to study, first of all, production cross sections, but also uh, in medium modifications of the spectral shape of the vector mesons. Uh, and in addition, in this beam time, we collected uh, data with exactly the same energy as it was in previous gold gold beam time, uh, just for three days. And thanks to this better efficiency in these three days, we got uh, the same statistical precision as it was in this previous gold gold experiment and with this we can make direct comparison of the system size here is an example where for silver silver for silver silver and for gold gold centrality was selected in a way to have comparison comparable number of participating nucleons so this is a comparison and of course furthermore quantitative analysis is ongoing uh, we can also reconstruct uh, scalar mesons, uh, phi zero and eta. One method to do that is to let uh, them decay into two photons. Uh, they okay uh, decay anyway. If we <laughs> and uh, uh, but then we let uh, convert these two photons in the detector material and reconstruct the e plus e minus pairs. Uh, and uh, of course, this analysis is. Uh, uh, Yet at, at the stage that you have a row spectra without corrections for efficiency, without extrapolations in the acceptance. Uh, but you can see uh, good statistical precision for both for phi zero and for eta. But we can also use alternative method, which is detecting photons directly in electromagnetic calorimeter, which we started installing before that beam time. It was uh, it was. Uh, Partially installed, and now it is already by now it is already fully operational. Here we can also reconstruct by zero. Statistical precision is uh, worse than uh, in the other method, but detector uh, definitely works. And here you can see already a spectra with the feeds, which will allow to extrapolate the yields outside of the acceptance. Uh, now, electromagnetic uh, high acceptance dielectron spectrometer is also good enough for reconstructing hadrons. And we have published uh, some time ago already a, a pion spectra in gold gold. What is interesting here is that uh, there is a difference between yields uh, in experiment and in uh, cutting edge uh, theories, these transport models. But also important to mention to you not only that, not only the yields, which could be some trivial shape, uh, trivial effect, but also important is to look at, uh, at the shape of the spectra. And definitely here is uh, more to be understood. And uh, on the other hand, it is also possible to generate dilepto, uh, the hadron spectra with uh, uh, thermal models. And uh, we are also trying to do that. We are using Terminator model, adjusting it with uh, some little details such that it is appropriate for low energy experiment. Uh, and we compare it with, with the data. So for example, transverse mass spectra for protons and pions are perhaps even better than one would expect. Uh, rapidity uh, is too narrow in the model. And this uh, requires a bit more work because for example, we know that uh, now for these figures, uh, spherical symmetry of the system was assumed, and it is perhaps uh, not realistic. One has to uh, parameterize the shape of the fireball uh, better. And one can also say that uh, similar, like in the case of dileptons, also for hadrons, uh, more data are uh, giving a profit. So also we have we are on the good track to provide pion spectra in silver silver collisions but we also study not only 
uh, spectra of, of, of hadrons, but also this coefficients of azimuthal azim isotropy with respect to the reaction plane, which is characterized by uh, Fourier coefficients. So for example, V1 has to be by symmetry of the system uh, odd function of rapidity. So it is useful to look at uh, at the slope in the uh, in the mid rapidity, uh, also second order coefficient at high energies. It is uh, it uh, it is positive, which means uh, emission preferably in the in the uh, reaction plane, uh, and at lower energies. In contrast, it is negative, which is because of shadowing by the spectator matter. And uh, the bottom line for all this is that to, to really predict it, to really calculate it and understand, especially as a function of beam energy, uh, one has to know in detail uh, the equation of state. Uh, then Hades has a very rich set of data for proton, deuteron, uh, and triton for Vn coefficients up to n equals six. So this is definitely a set of data which can be used and which can be compared to your favorite theories with favorite equations of state. Uh, and also promising data already coming from silver-silver uh, uh, experiment, analysis of course ongoing. Uh, here are examples of V up to uh, N equal three for pions uh, and also for second charge of pions also uh, the statistical precision will be similar. Uh, also, we are measure, we are provided data on uh, not only uh, collectivity, but also criticality. So we have uh, the measurement of uh, moments of the baryon number distribution. This is important because this is the lowest energy and uh, this criticality is again, one of these observables, which is important to be studied as a function of energy because as a function of energy, uh, we, learn the, we learn the most. Uh, we have cumulants which have direct uh, link also to the equation of stents, and we can translate these cumulants into multi-particle uh, correlation values. Uh, they have such an uh, um, dependence of uh, of the number of of nucleons of protons, proton multiplicity. And uh, such a dependence indicates that indeed such uh, multi-particle correlations are present in the system. Uh, so uh, now there is ongoing analysis also with new delta set and with with new models, uh, with new 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 analysis methods. Uh, and another thing that we that we measure is uh, uh, polarization. So. Uh, basically, it has been first measured at uh, star at at rig, uh, energies by start, and then they provided uh, the that they said that they observed most vertical fluid in the in the universe in the world. Uh, and important physics question here is the mechanism of translation of initial angular momentum into spin of particles. And uh, for measuring the spin, lambda. Baryon is uh, very convenient, the most convenient because uh, it decays weakly with the proton emitted preferably in the spin direction. Uh, so Hades measures is this also at, at lowest energy and, uh, and uh, uh, it observes the largest lambda polarization. There are at the moment already some theories which can uh, predict that but definitely more theories are needed and also more data, especially uh, in this gap of energies where, uh, where uh, there are no measurements yet. Uh, we not only measure lambda from strange particles, but uh, many of them. And we plot their, their yields as a function of mean number of participating nucleons in the collisions. And we observe that the yield scale uh, both in gold and also in silver with respective uh, power laws uh, which have the same uh, exponent for uh, all the particle species. And it is kind of uh, strange, maybe, because uh, uh, these different particles are produced at our energy collision energy below the NL threshold, and how below depends on the particle species. So rather, this experimental results shows that uh, 
the the amount just the sheer amount of strangeness in the system is scaling with the system size and then this strange quark can uh, be kind of freely exchanged between between states between particles and this comes uh, somehow in line with this uh, picture of uh, of uh, uh, yeah of percolation between between uh, 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 pion clouds in the system. So now, uh, uh, of baryons uh, being extended objects with uh, with bar with quark core and pion cloud resonates, pun intended, with the results of uh, of measured measured by Hades in. Uh, proton induced reactions and also pion induced reactions uh, where if you plot a ratio of the invariant mass spectrum to the prediction of point like UCD uh, you see a rise which can be described by the contribution of pion cloud which is a long dashed uh, uh, short dashed uh, red line and also if you look at uh, the this ratio for the contribution of uh, of uh, quark core then uh, it is equal unity. And uh, so now preliminary results for pion induced reactions uh, have also similar shape. Uh, coming back to strangeness, uh, we also measure uh, measure strange particles in uh, in silver silver reactions and uh, maybe interesting is uh, this ratio of phi to k on which can be uh, especially in silver silver measured with a good statistical precision so now to uh, future perspective we have a bunch of new detectors installed part of them in the forward region which will uh, serve in a uh, future experiment in uh, beam time next year uh, this will be not heavy ion this time but proton beam uh, to uh, improve the acceptance for hyperon reconstruction and also another detector is a time zero uh, detector based on uh, new technology, low gain avalanche uh, diode sensor. Uh, yes, it is shown here. It has a good uh, time precision. It is already pressured and uh, pre pre prepared and equipped for uh, this future experiment, but also it will have and many uh, other possible applications and also uh, there are broad collaborations possible on that so i say also that uh, the beam time is scheduled for the next year with with proton beams but also we have a uh, hope that other ideas will be possible to to realize in the future and then uh, i will not give you a real summary because my whole talk was just a summary, but you can recall which observables I was uh, showing you during during the talk. And uh, and with this, I thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to try answering your questions. Thank you very much. Right. Any questions from the audience? Curiosity. So you, you moved from gold gold to, to silver silver in the let's say a collision system. So uh, okay, of course you, you can test, for example, if uh, the, the the relevant variable uh, with which uh, the process scale is the, the number of uh, let's say the multiplicity or the, the, num the number of participants. But is there any other let's say special region reason for having a, a, an extended program in silver silver, which in the end is a smaller uh, nucleus uh, so that there are particular tests uh, that one can do with uh, with these other nucleus uh, so if there is something really particular i yeah we don't know yet we we have to analyze the data the reason was that uh, so like this gold gold experiment and also this silver silver that we have uh, was at maximum energy allowed by uh, magnetic rigidity of the accelerator so uh, we wanted to go a bit higher with energy 
and then we had to pay uh, the cost of, of system size. When you made the point about the cloud contribution, mm -hmm. that was from Dileptons, right? Yes. Uh, can you can you explain again what the connection was? Exactly the ratio, let's say, that you plot. That's. Can understand it. It is like this that, uh, okay, so, so yeah, ratio, we have uh, data. And uh, basically, from uh, just kind of uh, point like, so this is, uh, I guess, constant form factor, for example, one can also predict the spectrum. And, and this is uh, what is, yeah, divided what by what. Okay, so, so you, you're dividing by the point like QED factor without any hadronic structure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to the actual data. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, very good, thank you. Uh, more questions? Johan. Yeah, please come up front. Yeah. point like in the cloud you know they you know that there is the question what is the matter radius of the nucleon and the matter radius of the nucleon certainly is not zero and it's going to be probed at the electron ion collider for instance but also at CBAF. and currently you know there's several papers on that I just looked at one by Dima Kazeev. The matter radius is about 0.6 to 0.65 Fermi. And uh, I think that is when the electromagnetic radius is 0.8 or so. So isn't that the difference that you then that one should look at and not to the point like? in terms of a transition i mean it's a pseudo transition form factor i mean you work out dalit's decay baryonic resonance goes to ground state nucleon emitting a virtual photon that's the process here and you work this out in pure qed so point like in the sense that there is no extension of matter right mm -hmm. so that that's what's meant with pure qed that's what's written here and that you compared with what you measure. So what you probe with your virtual photo is exactly the charge transition at the vertex. So that's the idea. Cloud in that sense, I think he mentioned that because despite this observation, of course, there are investigations, which part, let's say, of a baryon carries the excitation if you come with a soft probe. But, and there are several experiments which, uh, give the impression that if you probe the, nucle the nucleon with a soft probe, that, that the cloud takes the energy in the first place. And then, of course, it's a mix of wave function at the end of the day, but the, the, that this cloud uh, discussion means that that uh, important part of the baryon taking the energy at the beginning, coupling to the photon, comes from the, from the C quarks and not from the valence quarks. That's what No, no, but I just... I just wanted to point out, you know, the, you know, this nomenclature quark core is of course some kind of an old picture. I think one should probably rethink this in terms of the electromagnetic probe and the gravitational probe. You know, the matter radius is that part of the mass of the nucleon that enters the energy momentum tensor. And that is different from, uh, you know, and, and the cloud contribution there plays essentially no role. So I think uh, 
you know, this old picture of just three quarks making up a large part of the nuclear mass is probably not what one should think about, but it is something, you know, that has to do with gluons. And that is exactly, you know, what these experiments at the ion collider want to probe. Comment on the chat. So uh, yeah, then let's try with uh, Ulrich Mosel. Uh, do you want to speak up for your question? Yeah, hello, greetings. Uh, the speaker showed quite nicely this big disagreement between all transport calculations and the pion numbers measured by Hadish. And this is a real problem. And I think it's not just a problem of transport. It's a real problem in the sense that these same pion numbers, of course, go into the dileptons. Pi plus, pi minus annihilation goes into rho and then into dilepton. Or the pi zero, Dalit's decay, of course, is immediately on that. And there are, of course, recipes around to bring the pion numbers down. But once you do that and get the pion numbers down by decreasing, for example, the, the initial delta population, then also the Dalit's decay, dileptons will go down. So reaching both together, agree, agreement for both the pion numbers and the dileptons is really on the horizon somewhere. There is a real problem. That's all I wanted to point out. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely something one uh, needs to straighten out. Uh, next question, Piotr. Yeah, it's actually not a, uh, hello, first of all. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's not a actually question, but a comment to this uh, pion cloud. I mean, uh, discussion. I will have a talk on this on, I think, Wednesday afternoon, so I will maybe talk more in details. But it's, I mean, in principle, it's, as Johan said, I mean, the, uh, what is uh, actually here plotted is, I mean, the dilepton uh, uh, spectrum divided by the predictions for the transition of delta to n, assuming that both particles are point-like. And what you can see here is a comparison to model which incorporates just this I mean, picture, which was uh, explained by Johan, that you have a core and that there is a, some surrounding pion cloud around and the photon couples either to core or couples to the pion cloud. In the hadronic language, you can also see the delta as an n pi cloud, n pi loop. And then you have a photon coupling either to nucle nucleon or to the pion. And actually this picture is actually taken also from the data measured in the electron uh, like region in the space like uh, region from electron scattering with people measured of course the transition of delta to nucleon very well and this one of these models which is shown here this is this rnp this is an uh, uh, ramalo and peña model which has exactly this picture built in namely there is a core consisting of three quarks and there is a pion cloud with this pion cloud contribution is actually calibrated from space-like region and then extrapolated to, to a, to a, a time-like region. So that what you see is this two contributions from the, from the pion cloud, which is plotted by the red line. This is actually what, according to this model, is just the contribution of a pion cloud to this time-like, uh, to this, to this uh, form factor. I mean, in a similar picture, we also do observe for the pion-induced reaction, so we can make similar uh, uh, let's say separation in, in this other picture, which is shown on the right-hand side, which is for N1520. So this is now second resonance region. And then you see much more pronounced, first of all, this increase of, a, of, a, of its ratio. So, and, and it's again, according to the same model, totally attributed to the pion cloud. Extra comment. Um, now we are, uh, time is up. So let's thank uh, Shimon Arash for a very nice overview again. And move on to the next speaker by Christoph Blume on the overview of the compressed baryonic matter experiment.
struggling to give a presentation in front of a live, live audience. I haven't had this since a while, I must say. And it's also particularly nice to have it here in this place. So I'm really very grateful for this invitation. And it's my pleasure today to give you an overview on the CBN experiment with special regards on rare probes. And now, of course, this does not. So now it works. Okay, so yeah, this would be my outline. So, okay, of course, CBM is addressing high MUB matter, which is the topic of this workshop. So, probably I don't have to say too much here. Uh, we also have a pointer. Let's see. Almost up. Yeah. Ah, this one. Good, then I will introduce to in case you don't know the, to you the CBM experiment and the physics program. I will discuss some detector components and mainly those which are related to rare probes. So of course I cannot discuss all the technology here. And then I give you some physics performance examples on the low mass range intermediate mass range, the leptons, Shamonia and AA and PA and also what we plan to do in terms of open charm. Better, we had a very nice introduction today. So, Fundamental questions that you want to address and what we of course also want to do with CBM is, what is the equation of state at neutron star densities? What is the phase structure of QCD matter? What kind of exotic bound states exist with strangeness? Uh, we want to study pyrosimilary restorations, large densities and charm in dense parallel matter. And this latter two topics are of course, what we uh, discuss in this workshop here. And in fact, the conditions between neutron star mergers and heavy ion collisions in this energy regime are quite similar, as you can see here in this relevant temperature and density region is, is quite strongly overlapping. First, you have to think ahead on, on what was possible in the previous programs and the big step that we want to do with CBM is to really crank up the interaction rates by several orders of magnitude. I mean, Simon just told you what you can do with an interaction rate in this order, which is already impressive, but then we want to go higher in almost yeah, two or three orders. And that, of course, I mean, if there's anything better than having much statistics is then to have even more statistics. So that is really what will allow you to do high accuracy measurements and in particular, of course, address rare probes, which in this low energy regime really is statistics hungry. Go up to 10 to the seven interactions per second. So this is unprecedented. And it's also what the JPARC community tries to achieve. So that will be really a big leap in this direction. To do this, this is the facility for anti-proton and ion research. I mean, most of you are, of course, very familiar with the existing GSI facility shown here. And this is then the uh, extension of the uh, accelerator setup, including this SIS 100 accelerator, which will be our main workhorse. And then here will be the CBM experiment. So the SIS 100 produces primary ion beads of different varieties. So we can have gold up to 10 to the nine per second, up to 11 GV per nucleon. You can also, of course, accelerate smaller systems, which is even allows you to go even higher energies because now you don't have to drag along that many neutrons and you can do proton beams. Climb, so the building and shell construction should be complete next year and also show a picture and this is looking quite good. And then we hope that we can start operation in 2025 with this uh, intermediate objective, which will cover all this parts here in green. So this is what is being built with the available funding right now. And then uh, modularized start version will include also the rest of what is shown here. An experiment, so it's a typical fixed target experiment with a magnetic uh, spectrometer here. So we have a superconducting magnet here. Inside will be the, the tracking devices. So that is the STS, which is the main workhorse here. And then there is also the MVD in front of it. I will come to this later. And then several detectors, which are relevant by rare probes like the rich TRD and the much, the muon arm. There's of course, plenty of other detectors here, time of flight system, BSD for event characterization and so on, but I will not 
discuss this here. Okay, the, the acceptance of the, the spectrometer is mainly the forward region, so going from roughly mid rapidity to forward. Um, peak interaction rate, as I said, we, we aim at 10 megahertz, a bit less for the MVD, depends. But all this, of course, means that you have to have fast and radiation out detectors, so that is quite a challenge. And also the readout is uh, different, like in lower experiments where you have triggered devices, now we go for a free streaming data acquisition, which in turn means that you have to do the whole reconstruction of your event in four dimensions, so space and time on equal footing, which is also a new approach. And we want to do online event reconstruction selection and in the end we will have a data rate in the order of one terabyte per second. So that's, all these are of course quite some challenges. Now this is as it was looking in June. So you can see here, so this is the accelerator. So this is already underground covered. So the tunnel is ready. And this is the cave where the CBM experiment will be placed. And meanwhile, there's even the roof being covered. So the, the build construction, but also the, the experiment itself, there is something existing. Just want to show you that. So we are building or operating at the moment a mini CBM, which is a full system test with high rate nucleus nucleus collisions being performed. Yes, the SI is 18 at GSI, which contains components from all the different detectors here. And this is, of course, mainly devised to work out the, the data readout, data transport of all subsystems in a common synchronized data stream, which is not an easy task. But I think in the last beam time this spring, we had a really, very, really, very successful run and then uh, made a huge step in verifying that this free streaming data, data acquisition can actually be be uh, employed as we think it can. It's called behind it. So we want to use the setup also to do lambda reconstruction and to measure uh, uh, excitation function of lambda production. So it's not just a, a technique test. Here. Of the physics program of CBM. So if you want to do some publication, summarizes the main topics. So as I said, so the QCD equation of state is of the foremost relevant for us. So we want to do collective flow measurements of all particles we can identify. Uh, particle production at threshold energies. Then there are uh, observables directly related to the phase transition like excitation function of hyperons. But here, of course, in particular, the excitation function of intermediate mass dileptons, where I will show some performance studies. of our concept quantities will be looked at. Chiral symmetry restoration at large will be, will be studied with the Romas dileptons. Of course, there's a large program on strange matter. Hypernuclei is a very important topic. Metastable objects with strangeness like dibarions. It's of course also an important ingredient. And then there is the heavy flavor part of the program. So this essentially applies to cold and dense matter here. So we want to measure the excitation function of open and hidden charm production in this area. Group this in several phases. So what's going on right now is phase zero. So this is before uh, the real experiment actually starts. So that is what I just meant, mentioned here, the mini CBM setup at SIS 18, where we look at subthreshold lambda and like hypernuclear production. And then there will be the day one physics as soon as the accelerator is ready. So as I said, we start operating 2025 and then 26 will be most likely to be the real serious, first real serious beam time. Of course, going not to the maximum interaction rate, but slowly getting there. But of course, this is good enough to do real a thorough study of dileptons, but also look at all these other things here. Yeah, and once the modulized start version is fully operational in 2027, we will go a full blast and then also the uh, tape side production will be an important topic, charm particle interaction, cold nuclear matter, et cetera, et cetera. So this is roughly the, the timeline. 
Okay, so I want to, to inter introduce a few detector components which play an important role here. And one here is the MVD, which is the micro vertex detector and the project later is sitting there. So in case you have questions to this project, please ask Joachim. Um, this detector is the main re uh, purpose is the secondary vertex reconstruction in the order of 10 micrometer resolution. So it has to be operated in vacuum and magnetic field and will consist of four stations of CMOS most pixel sensors. It's like 300 MIMOSIS chips, 500 micrometers thin, with a power dissipation of this order and a readout time of 10 microseconds, which is for this technology, of course, a, a challenge. And the other challenge, of course, is radiation tolerance, which has to be higher than 10 to the 13 non. Uh, Identification is important for rare probes, and there we have essentially two detectors. One is the rich ring imaging Cherenkov detector that is for rather for low momentum electrons, uh, uses CO2 as a radiator, and has an ultraviolet photon detector consisting of MAPTs. And you have seen that already. So, right now, these same MAPTs are part of the hardest setup as a part of the phase phase zero program. So this, this concept is, if you want, already validated and running. So this uh, rich in CBM will be then rather larger implementation, of course, with a different radiator and mirror and all of that. Electron identification detector is the TRD, which is, of course, a bit closer to my heart because I'm my group is working on that in Frankfurt together with a group of Anton and Onik in Münster and a group of Bucharest. Meant to provide electron identification now in the high momentum region, so above five to six GeV, because this is roughly where the ridge runs out of steam. And then if you want to go at the high momentum electrons, you need to have some additional ID capabilities here. And that is what the TRD will provide. So the, the requirements are relatively moderate. So we want to have a fine suppression in the order of above 20, which I think we can easily achieve. And it will consist of four detector layers, each 55 modules, or summary like 330,000 readout channels and reactive area of 114 square meter. And it uses MWPCs as readout chambers with relatively thin gas gap because the detector has to be fast. And that's why. This is as thin as possible. Yeah, and we use polyethylene foam foil, foil stacks as radiator. You can see here a test setup that we, we measured at DAISY and the real one will look quite similar. Measuring electrons or dielectrons is of course to measure the muons. And there we have the uh, muon chambers. So that will replace the ridge. So the ridge will be craned out of its position and then the muon arm will be moved in its place here. And that can come in different configurations. So we have a different uh, combination of absorbers, carbon, iron, and concrete combination with several tracking stations, gems and RPCs. And the TRD is the last tracking station in the setup. So for instance, a low beam energy is up to 4 GB, it will look like that. And then if you go to higher energies where we need to have higher absorption, then, then you could put in more uh, absorbers and also more layers of tracking. The physics uh, topics. So one important part, as I said, are the dileptons. So the low mass region is, of course, very important here in terms for looking at the chiral symmetry restoration and also you want to study the excess radiation or the energy dependence of it. Intermediate dileptons, mass dileptons allow you to access the fireball temperature into row A1 mixing, as Simon already showed you. And so in principle, in the interesting region, you have like these two measurements. So one that was shown in the talk before by Edis and then any 60 and what we want to do, of course, is to cover the region in between and to do a very, very systematic measurement uh, to really come up with an energy dependence of this low parameter so that in the end you have some real caloric curve of the business. 
And that should provide some sensitivity, whether there is a first order phase transition. Uh, and if you're really lucky, you will see some mon monotonic behavior of just energy dependence. Yeah, so we estimated like we need like 10 to the 11 events, roughly 20 days of data taking for 10% statistical uncertainty here. So that is what is shown here in this blue points here in this figure compiled by Tatiana. So for the dimuon channel, we have the challenge that we want to measure muons at low energies and that the high the particle rates are still relatively high in the first detector. Um, so the strategy that we employ is that we do, do identification after the hadron absorber with the media tracking layers and use triple gem detectors with PET readout here. And as I said, for the low beam energies, we can remove the last two absorbers so that can, the setup can be adapted to the corresponding needs of the particular energy. And this is a uh, dileptom spectrum as we would expect it for, for this energy, like 4.3 GeV um, for the very central events. And as here then the, the uh, thermal radiation here. But this, of course, the simulation is, is very limited still in statistics. So it's no comparison to what you will have in the real experiment. With the dielectron electron part, now here the challenge is that there is no electron identification before the tracking station. And that, of course, the material budget will introduce some background here. But here the strategy is then to provide sufficient fine discrimina discrimination with the detectors I described before. And also we try to reduce the background by reconstructing pairs from gamma conversion and by zero Dalitz decay by the topological cut. And here's a similar performance study in the dielectron channel. So these are just five times 10 to the eight events, which is of course nothing in terms of data taking, it just corresponds to three minutes in the end. You cannot do much more at the moment. You have to uh, come up with a fast simulation scheme to, to do this properly, but that's what we're working on. Ammonia, we also want to measure this 100. You, of course, you are mostly sub-threshold, which is a particular challenge. So the production is rare, but we think the measurement is still feasible. And then in heavy ion collisions, you have multiple collision processes, will, which will help you in the, enhancing the production rate. And of course, this is particularly interesting since there's no existing data at the moment below 160 GeV. So um, yeah, this is the energy region that we want to cover, so which is essentially below the PP production threshold. But I mean, there are of course models that also predict some substantial yield in the uh, in both decay channels, time union and dielectron. What is of course nice if, if you use then uh, symmetric nuclei, you can also uh, go to higher energies and that will bring you above the production threshold so that this can also be addressed. Commons figure, this is in the dimuon channel in gold gold. So it shows a very clear uh, signal here. So this is based on your QMD background event with some embedded signal. I think this is from HSD predictions. Yeah. Vectors. And yeah, this is what we extract from this simulation. So we would like have like, like 30,000 shapes in four weeks of measurement if you go to the highest interaction rate. Yeah. Here, the particle identification has been enhanced by using neural network. I'll show this just that you can give you an idea of the acceptance. So it covers forward and part of mid rapidity. And this is the efficiency as a function of momentum, which time momentum is already quite substantial. Jape uh, side propagation called nuclear matter which means you want to study proton nucleus interaction. Well, you probe the resonance nucleon interactions and can place 
important constraints on theoretical models here. I mean, I just have this example here, which shows this transparency ratio versus Feynman X. And this has also been studied here in the dimuon channel in proton nucleus. And here we extract like 500 JPSI in four weeks of data taking, but I mean, you see, this is a really very nice signal and almost no background. Electron channel, um, this is also proton nucleus. But still there's a very clear peak in the simulation. And from this, you also come up with similar numbers of reconstructed shape size. Um, so the efficiency is a bit lower, so it's like 5% because here we have to place a PT cut, but that can of course still be optimized. An open charm, so in heavy ion collision, again, we will be sub-threshold for large system like gold gold. But uh, if we go then again to symmetric nuclei, we can also exceed the production threshold. And of course, it's a very intriguing question, what are the production mechanisms relative at the relevant of these energies? How do charm quarks propagate in dense matters? Is there indications for collectivity of open charm and all these important questions? And <clears throat> That is what we want to do with heavy ion collisions and in proton nucleus collisions, of course, you can then study charm production at threshold and study called nuclear matter effects. I mean, there's a similar prediction by Jan for the relevant energy regime. And that is of course a quite Common study has been done. So for instance, here in the uh, decay of the neutral D meson in K on pion in nickel nickel collisions at 15 GeV. And here, of course, the MVD is essential because that uh, allows us to separate the secondary vertex. So I introduced this already and uh, expected yield here is in the order of 600 D zeros in four weeks of data ta taking even at the reduced data rate that will be used for the MVD. Collision similar, same decay channel. And also here, I mean, you can really get a very nice signal also with almost no background here. Part of the CBM physics program, that's why we want to go to the high interaction rates. Dileptons are an important part. So we measure both the dimuon and direct on channel. Uh, the energy dependence of the fireball temperature is one of the exciting topics we want to go for. Quaponia is important, dimuon and the direct on channel will be measured uh, mostly sub threshold in the high mass nuclei, but also you can go higher with the symmetric nuclei. Cold meta nuclear meta effects will be started with proton nucleons. And of course, open charm is also accessible due to the very good vertex resolution. By showing the collaboration, so at the moment it's 56 institutions, although I think this is already outdated there. We have some newcomers already, and of course, new collaborators are always welcome. Uh, the typical picture as you have it nowadays, so this was from the collaboration meeting we had two weeks ago, but of course I also like to prepare, prefer to show the people in real life. So this was the last meeting that we had in person, which was in Kolkata in 2019. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and yeah, I'll take questions. Any questions from the room? in energy so uh, you say you, you you cover uh, let's say you have a certain coverage uh, in uh, angular coverage and so in rapidity is it varying uh, uh, let's say a, a, a lot uh, in uh, in the uh, let's say uh, in the energy range uh, do you have to um, displace the detectors in a sense in order to cover uh, the same rapidity region at all energies or your acceptance is large enough that you don't care
showing it was for the JXI. This was a laboratory rapidity, I yeah, guess. This is laboratory. And so mid rapidity stands uh, at eight. At energy, okay, so it, so it should be. Uh, three, okay. Is this a question from the outside? As concerning the open charm production, so D mesons, um, the energies are comparable to, to Nika, to the BM at N experiment, for instance. But the luminosity, of yes. course, the uh, uh, interaction rate is much lower. Would you think that, uh, I mean, Nikas starts earlier. Uh, what, what can be done uh, in, with this uh, interaction rate uh, concerning charm at uh, BM at N? So BM at N. Um, yeah, you had you had shown this uh, sub threshold production yeah, yeah. of demosons. The multi strange um, hadrons, but uh, I'm asking because it's it's an ongoing discussion. Shall one set up uh, something for charm, open charm, sub threshold? Very, very optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Opportunity yeah. is there is some sure, experience the maybe uh, comparing. With the Cowan uh, sub threshold production, which was also a bit of surprise at GSI at that time. Yeah, and uh, what can we expect? Huh? So, for the open charm, or the well, whether it would make sense for the rest of the charm? Yeah, is, is there a to the physics yeah? Of course. Case. I mean, if you if you can learn about the uh, you know charm diffusion in baryon rich matter, that that it's a key point. Yeah. Yeah. But if we have if we don't have enough particles, then you need one charm. <laughs> you need one charm core, and uh, you know, and well, then it's a question about the statistic, right? Um, the, the other the other issue is really the uh, charmonium, if I may uh, come back to that and take my privilege here to ask a, a question. Um, so we learned in particular it's from the NA60 measurements and other FPS measurements, but in particular NA60 that this nuclear absorption cross section has a very strong energy dependence. And if you want to have any control about what's happened to the JPSI uh, in, in the medium, we, we need precise, rather precise knowledge about that PA the behavior of JPSI and PA. Now, the problem is uh, the, the PA, well, I don't know, it will stop at some point, right? Maybe not, you know, but likely it will stop because of the threshold. But in the AA, the, your curves keep going, right? So there will be a bit of an issue how you would uh, extrapolate that nuclear absorption below threshold, right? Because you, in a way you cannot measure it because yeah. of the threshold, right? So, 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 but that, re can, can you show that, uh, that nice graph again? Yeah, yeah, this one, for example, right? You see the JPSI uh, goes into the uh, sub threshold as if there's nothing happening, right? Uh, but and there's a lot of physics in there. But uh, you know, one, one needs to understand uh, the PA. So, so my question is, what is, in fact, what do you guys think about PA? Is there a threshold in PA, or is there in, like more like in PP, or is the, the PA like more more like, like PA? Of course, it's not like PP. I mean, it's, you have a nucleus around, so there are secondary effects, which will. And to AA, so I don't know, it's way in between. Then maybe you are in. You want to come up? Oh, yeah. you? Yeah. Please. Sorry. Whoever wants to come up, please.
also a discussion for the for the whole audience, but I'm I'm always a bit critical with this so-called term sub-threshold production, even strangeness at cis-18 energies. I mean, whoa, I mean, if you have a nucleus around, there are all kinds of many body effects which lift the threshold up, right? Like you have short-range correlations, you have thermal momentum. Now, if I go to, to Charmonium, which is, as we also heard this uh, first talk, is a very compact object. I have even more problem because we know, we understand to do it in platonic interactions, but now if you go softer and softer in the collision, how do you transfer the, the full energy in such a small object like a germonium? I think this is not at all understood because there's no the theoretical guidance. Same thing is, I think here, Jan, you let decay uh, baryonic resonances into uh, a JSI. Well, uh, nobody knows whether that can, nature is able to do that. I mean, we have to find it out, but to come back to your question, I mean, that tells you it, measurements are important because it's very challenging because it's extremely rare probe at low energies, but without measurements, I think we also the theory has a hard time to improve understanding of these processes. Yeah? So whenever you, you think you have high rates and a good detector, put the vertex detector, I mean, in any case, also an upper limit is always a helpful measurement that it can help you to rule out certain approaches. I mean, if you can get there in the region, then why not? Yeah, but the point is to, to, mm. make, a, to make a point for, let's say, a long mm. observation period, you need to have a specific case. I mean, say, well, yeah, yeah, you have to look at it. I mean, I mean, with learning this and the approach mm. in this case. Yeah. This was uh, maybe a comment on, on the cold nuclear matter effects and on, on the JSI. side. So I, I, I think that in that case, what matters is the, let's say, square root of S of the JPSI nucleon system. And so you, you are going to need some models to relate the PA at a certain energy, uh, let's say, with, with the Fermi motion distributions and, uh, and all of that. And then maybe you, you, you can get some, some information on that. Let me just ask you, for 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 these uh, simulations of the JPSI with, uh, with the with uh, the with with the background, how was the background generated? With uh, do, do you know? Usually we use European. Ah, so it, uh, it's all done. Uh, yeah. So we will. So basically, you hybrid develop, events. We have a signal generator and then okay. Okay, so we have to move on. Thank you very much, Christo, for this very nice and interesting talk. And, uh, the next talk is. Uh, on the uh, NA61 uh, experiment online uh, presented by Marek Gadzitski. Marek, are you around? Yes, I am here. Great. Very good, thank you. I start sharing. Yeah, can you see my slides? So that we can see you, Marek? You, you, yeah, I, I have to switch on camera, yes. Yeah, photo is good, but... <laughs> we know it's you, but... We know. <laughs> yeah, that's you, good. Yeah, you see me, Hi. hopefully my slides. Uh, so good, good afternoon and thanks for inviting me here. Uh, actually, maybe I, I want to uh, mention uh, that uh, seems to be outside participants have problems in a continuous voice transmission from, from Trento. So we, we number of us on chat uh, uh, mentioned this, so it's not our problem, but probably Trento. Maybe it's related to the microphone because when Joachim was speaking close to the microphone, this was perfect continuous. Whereas when Christoph was moving, uh, then we have a longer period of uh, total silence. Or maybe you can uh, take care of speaking closer to the microphone. Okay, but let me uh, come back to my subject. So uh, I was asked to introduce uh, NA61. Uh, I title NA61 physics programs. I, I have plural here programs because I will talk about all three programs measurement for neutrino physics, cosmic ray physics, and finally the main subject of this topic heavy ion physics, but actually 
our program of measurements for open, uh, of open charm, which is really the target, I believe, or belongs to the uh, to the uh, core of this workshop, will be addressed by Pavel Stasher on Wednesday. So this is what you will uh, you will give a very general introduction. Uh, so first, uh, in a sixty one, I'm taking you now from Darmstadt to to Geneva. We are at CERN. NA61, successor of NA49. Some of you are old enough to remember NA49. So what we are performing are hadron production measurements in hadron proton, hadron nucleus, and nucleus, nucleus collisions in a rather broad range of beam momenta. We are fixed target experiment. So we are talking about the beam momenta in laboratory. Experiment is located uh, at the SPS in the north area. You see this logo. Actually, maybe I should improve on my pointer how to do it. I put a spotlight probably here. Will this be better? Not, ah, yes. Yes, now it's a red, probably you see the red pointer. So we are somewhere here a beam line which transports beam from SPS to us is called H2 beam line. Oh, this way. Okay, so uh, from the left, beams from SPS, primary beams, then we have a T2 target area extracted beam to the T3 target area when either the, the primary the target is removed and the primary goes a beam goes to our beam line in a 61 or secondary beams are produced or even we are planning to use tertiary beams putting targets somewhere in between t2 and a 61 now uh, what beams we have actually it's an impressive variety of masses and momenta we start from low energy pions and end up with top SPS energy lead. So both in, in this maybe unusual plot when you vertically have a mass of the beam and horizontally total beam momentum, not beam momentum per nucleon, but total to make this product more impressive. Uh, then you see that we go several order of magnitudes in one or the other direction so the left bottom corner pions at about 10 gv momentum and upper corner that's a letter uh, at top sps energy actually you see here dashed area we are planning to even move to the very low energy region for hadrons from 10 to several gv mostly by building tertiary Hadron beam, and this mostly motivated by uh, physics uh, of uh, neutrino experiments, re requirements of neutrino experiment. Detector and its upgrade again, it's like, like a fixed target experiment. We are pretty asymmetric, everything is sitting downstream of the, of the target, which is located here. We start with the vertex detector, uh, CMOS sensors, uh, we take Alice Alpine sensors. Then we have four large volume TPCs, four small volume TPCs on the beam, time of flight detectors, MRPCs from, from Dubna, and projectile spectator too. This time we have two projectile spectator detectors uh, with standard parameters. Uh, acceptance is large, it's about 50%. Vertex detector space, uh, uh, point reconstruction resolution of the order of 5 micron, TPC of the order 200 microns, uh, DDX 4%, time of light about 100 picosecond, and the event rate about 1, one kilohertz. Now, a physics program. So we perform measurements for neutrino experiments. Uh, and JPAC and Fermilab cosmic ray experiment, Pierre, Pierre Auger Observatory, AMS, and, and others. 
and strong interaction that's heavy ions, but not only also properties of, of rare heavy resonances uh, under study. Now, concerning neutrinos, actually the, the basic question with drives neutrino experiments is what happens with neutrinos flying across Japan and the United States, European uh, programs are now close. And we started with measurements for T2K uh, long baseline neutrino experiment at, at the JPAC. And how we contribute. We contribute by trying to help answer the question what happens in targets of neutrino experiments. So you see we are how the neutrino beam is produced. You have high intensity proton beam in case of Jerry Park, it's momentum 30 GV per C colliding with target. This target, it's not our thin target for physics of strong interaction, but a big cylinder, typically one meter long. So this is graphite, for instance. Then of course you almost all protons interact and then produce pions, kaons, protons, and so on. These guys are focused by so-called hole magnets and then decay in the decay pipe, producing in particular neutrinos and then neutrinos travel from uh, through the so-called near detector phase and then a couple of hundred kilometers far detector and by comparing neutrino flux at near and far detector, you get oscillation parameters. Now, it appears that it's not actually sufficient near detector, it's not sufficient to establish initial neutrino beam properties. So this is why uh, any 61 measurements are needed. We measure flux of hadrons coming out of the long target of neutrino, long targets of neutrino experiments. And this can be put in, in Fluca, Jant, and then simulate uh, it's perturbation magnetic field and decays, and then you get a detailed description of the neutrino, initial neutrino flux. So uh, this plus illustrate examples of measurements for T2K, uh, for yeah, JPAC, you see different models and we, you see that it's completely, uh, in this case, actually it's Geisha, we took it to show that models may behave completely in a completely crazy way. And that's recent measurement for Fermilab. Oops, sorry, I have to, I have to switch my phone. And that's uh, for Fermilab. And then again, you see that models do not perform well. Measurements are needed. So we started this measurement at the history and future of our measurements for neutrino experiment experiments. So we started in 2007 already for JPAC. Last period we measured, uh, we took data for Fermilab in the run free next starting from next year, we will take data for both JPAC and Fermilab neutrino experiments. And finally, uh, after LS3, we plan to continue JPAC and Fermilab measurements, but with the final replica targets for uh, Hyper-K and and Dion. These measurements consist of many, many different uh, reactions, different uh, proton, pions, also chaos as a beam particles, different collision energy and different targets. So it's a huge array of measurements. Cosmic rays, basic question, what is the origin of very high energy cosmic rays? Uh, and we, how we try to contribute to answer this question is what happens with cosmic rays in interstellar medium. Uh, actually, initially we start with somewhat different question, what happens uh, in extensive air showers, particles propagated through the atmosphere. But now this is the second question it's deriving us. So the extensive air showers, uh, measurements for uh, for them, what we do, we take a pion beam at different momenta 
collide with the light nuclear targets like carbon here and just study inclusive hadron production with example rho zero at 150 GeV. You see models don't describe it, models then are tuned to this data and then better predict a development of rare showers. Now, propagation in galaxy, what we actually measure, we measure a cross-section of fragmentation of different beam nuclei. We started with the carbon pilot measurement is indicated on the right plot. Carbon collides with proton and you go to beridium 10, beridium 11, that's the point we have. And this allows you to, again, a better model what happens with with nuclear propagating uh, interstellar me medium. So the cosmic ray measurements started in 2009. That's what they were measurements with pion beams of okay, extensive air showers. Then we switch to the cross-section measurement, fragmentation cross-section measurement. Uh, the first round was in 2018. We used here fragmented lead beam to get a whole zoo of different light ions as a beams. And then we will perform systematic precise measurement in RAN3 starting from 22. So you see here a zoo of requested reactions measured different, different uh, projectiles from uh, silicon 28 and uh, the lightest here requested is beryllium 10. Now we go finally to to baby to our baby strong interactions uh, and I address question uh, it's related to uh, heavy ion physics. So we 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 asking question what happens when strongly intermatic think matter gets hotter denser in the volume changes. So you see that's our speciality. We don't only change collision energy, but also a size of colliding nuclei, ultimately hoping to plot everything in the two-dimensional plots, root of S and number of wounded nucleons or size of the or nuclear mass number for central and light collisions. Uh, one of the driving questions is, can we see effects of critical point of strongly interacting matter. On the left, you have a, a, a on the left pl plot vertically, you have a measure of fluctuations, one of the many measures of fluctuations we use, plotted in this two dimensional space with a conclusion nothing special is seen. To the right, you see. Another way of quantifying fluctuation, so-called skate factorial moment, second order uh, of protons. This is so-called intermittency way of analyzing data that you study fluctuation, multiplicity fluctuations of proton as a, a, a function of the size of being in momentum. This m square uh, uh, is number of uh, beans in, in a fixed momentum, the, the, the total momentum byte we have for the analysis we divide into M square pixels up to, to say 20,000. And uh, well, everything is, is flat at one, that's actually interpretation. Yes, there is no evidence for critical point so far. I, there are reasons to study intermittency that, that this way of analysis should be really sensitive to critical point. So actually, we, we continue this for all reactions and all, all uh, 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 maybe not all, but all protons and pions. For pions, we can go to higher order moments. Uh, to F. Up to now, we went up to F4. That's example of let let at 30 GB. 30 GV laboratory is about 7.6, 7.7 in square root of S. And again, no signal. Now this no signal, we're trying to quantify what does it mean, no signal, no, no, no signal of critical points. So we built a simple toy models having, with has two components, uncorrelated 
a paratikas and paratikas correlated according to power law correlation function in the transverse momentum space in this case. And then this model has two parameters, the, this exponent of the correlation fac function, which is plotted here uh, vertically and the ratio of correlated to all uh, particles. And then by comparing this to our measurements, we can say which pair of parameters is excluded, this kind of standard procedure of the exclusion plot and which is allowed. And that's an example of such exclusion plot telling our sensitivity. Actually, QCD inspired models say that phi two should be five over six for protons in this case. So it means that we are excluding for this phi two, this is the, the, the power of the power of the correlation function for two particle correlation function. And then we are excluding a fraction, fraction of correlated pairs uh, larger than of the other over per mil. And it's a horizontal scale in percent, so we are pretty sensitive. Now, and the, the, the next point, a inclusive particle spectra or multiplicities. An example here, what we are doing. Actually, we try now to, to, to plot something which we call diagram, but not strongly interacting matter or QCD diagram, which is the, something very popular and discussed here. Uh, already in lens, but diagram of high energy nuclear collisions. I will tell you in a moment what I mean here. But first summarizing the, our key results, left plot, the, 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 oh, the left plot, K2 pi ratio admitted rapidity, vertically square root of S horizontally, compilation of different uh, data coming from different uh, collision centers of all the PP, right? That's the light and dark blue, that's a PP. Then we have beryllium, beryllium. So this central beryllium, beryllium collision, that's uh, green. And then we have argon scandium. See so this the relatively small energy range, that's an A61 SPS energy range from the top to to from the top to bottom energy at SPS, argon scandium, and then we go to, to lead lead. You see that, that you probably know the horn, right? Lead lead, gold gold, famous K to pi peak, data from NA49 originally, but then complemented by star, and this is uh, LHC Alice. And then uh, you see that going down in size of the colliding nucleon kills the kills the core completely. Already argon scandium has its high. Uh, it's much higher than PP, but there is no horn in argon scandium. Moreover, if you go to beryllium, beryllium, it essentially overlaps with PP. Actually, before we started this measurement, we tried it to get a feeling. What do we expect for beryllium? And argon took statistical model, put canonical strangeness suppression, and, and check uh, assume there is a horn in the model and try to see how this canonical strain and suppression will work. And then we, we got uh, essentially the same results for argon scanium because the, the strangeness copiously produced, right? Way mean multiplicity of, of strange particles, chaos is much higher than one. So there's no canonical suppression. And already beryllium, beryllium was like a 90% of lead. So that, that, that this was a big surprise that argon scandium at low energy is lower than lead, lead, and beryllium, beryllium is, is at a PP, doesn't, didn't even move at all above a, a PP. Now you can uh, look at this fixed collision energy. I took 150 GV, our top energy, it's here, yeah. and plotted. K to pi, the same quantity vertically, but as a function of number of mean number of wounded nucleons. And then you see what I tried to explain on the previous plot, that proton and beryllium are the same. Okay, that's actually here, you see that's for all collision energies true. 
And then argon and lead are very similar, fine. But that's not true for all, all, all lower energies, right? Here at top energy, it's true, but for, for 30 GV or whatever, 20, it's not true anymore. Uh, then argon is in between beryllium and, and lead. Uh, actually, if you look under a microscope in PP data, you see kind of break, we call it. So there is a rapid increase at low energies and then somewhere in the middle of SPS energy range, uh, this rapid increase uh, stops. You have much uh, flatter dependence. We call it that what we see here is transition from horn to this break in PP collisions. And this, uh, this transition from PP beryllium low system sizes to to heavy argon and lead we call onset of fireball and the left lot of course for lead lead we call it onset of lead on fire. Now, if we, we think about that, we try to put this, uh, this information, experimental information in a plot uh, inspired by our theory colleagues, what can happen at which collision energy, at which system size. Then we come to something which I already advertised, diagram of high energy nuclear collisions, the first kind of sketch. Uh, so at, so what you have plotted here, vertical is nuclear mass number. I assume we call it central nucleus, nucleus collisions, so nuclear mass number for them. Uh, horizontally, you have collision energy, square root of S. And what, what these plots which I showed you tell us, well, if you have lead lead, you increase collision energy somewhere at a square root of S of the order of 10. We have the horn, step, kink, and so on. We say, okay, that's onset of uh, the confinement. We go from the, from the uh, confined matter to coagulant plasma with all the confinement, carry symmetry, restoration, and so on. We label it simply onset of the confinement, the transition from had on resonance confined matter to program plus. Good. That's nothing new. Uh, now, however, at low masses, PP go to the extreme, we see effects which I, one of them I labeled break, right? This collision energy dependence changes rapidly. It's very different than for that, that collision, but changes rapidly. If you look to, uh, at models, you are KMD, Smash, and, and others, actually, they also say we have such a change. It looks different, depends on model, how it changed, the collision energy at which this change happens. Also changes can be 3 GV, can be 4, can be 5, but there is usually always something. It is a change from the panel production from the uh, uh, dominated by resonance creation and decay to hadron production to, dominated by strings, stretching and decay. Now, Edward Shuryak says that probably what we see when we go now, we, we are in the string region, right? High, high enough energy and increases system size. And I say the, your onset of fireball, you have a rapid jump from PP beryllium to argon lead lead. He says, I know what is it. This is a collapse of strings which interact. There is an inter attractive interaction between them and the, the given density of strings. They really collapse, creating coagulum plasma. So at the end of the day, you can say, OK, then we, we try to see what happens in different regions. Nuclear mass number is square root of S. You have, you have now three regions. Resonances, hadrons, resonances, QGP, and strings. Now, a uh, history of measurement for strong interactions, we've concentrated on critical point and also the confinement up to 2018. And then we are now switching to open charm measurements. As I said, Pavel will talk about this. That fits better to the subject of this workshop than my talk. And then motivated by this phase, di di not phase di diagram of, of uh, nuclear collisions, we want to study this further after LS3. So the, up to now we measured, this is what is, what is measured here, the, the green stuff. In RAN3 we measured the, of the two energies, let, let for open charm, that's gray. 
and after LS3 run for, we want to measure uh, the yellow guys. Okay, that's everything. Collaboration looks like this. You have also here who belongs to the collaboration and you have some links to useful information. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm close to the microphone. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear. Them. All right. Any questions? Yes, I have a question, Mark. Yeah. When you showed uh, the, uh, the strange horn there, the, the K over pi ratio, do you have the kaons and the pions separately also? What I want, what I'm after is if you have a horn, I mean, this could happen because pions go down or kaons go up or both, or what's happening to the individual particles. Right, right. Of course, they are published. They're published, but <laughs> you see this plot is, is, is a compilation of the world data published by a number of collaboration, different collision energies. And first, what they publish are the spectra of pions, pions and chaos separated, and the spectra lead to the rapidity density. Yeah, and well, I was just wondering if you would provide a plot like that which you have shown here just for pounds and crayons uh, alone. Unfortunately, Do you see? Not within this uh, slides, but I, I can, you know, the, uh, to, to see what happens with pions, they, they, the plot corresponding plot that what we do, we plot a mean pion multiplicity mm -hmm. as a function of square root of s and compare different system sizes. To do this, you have to normalize, you have to divide the mean pion multiplicity by number, a kind of normalization to take into account that the size of the system changes. We usually we divide it by number of wounded nucleons, right, or participants in different language. Such a plot, uh, it's published since this is quite a number of time. Uh, it, we call it King plot. And what happens for if you compare uh, to, to make it short, let let dependence with PP, that you have a pion enhancement quantified by this ratio, mean number of pions per wounded nucleons at high collision energies of the about 20-30%. And pion suppression at low collision energy, low means below 10 GV square root of S. So the let let curve, this is a PP dependence, say pion per, per two wounded nucleons is two in PP, and let let crosses the the the, the proton proton dependence. And then intermediates One more. are in, in, in between, of course. <laughs> okay, there's another question, last question from Anton on the chat. Yes, hello, nice to see you uh, all, even remotely. <laughs> um, I have a, a comment actually on this uh, question by Professor Mosel uh, to, to Marek. Um, I have that plot actually, I will have it in my slides uh, on uh, Wednesday, and it's not easy to distinguish uh, features in individual kaons and pion multiplicity. And um, I wanted to comment that in fact, the K to pi ratio is a byproduct of strangeness conservation and baryochemical potential decrease as a function of energy. And the lambda to pi has of course, as is well known, a peak which is much sharper and um, because of the trade-off in the strangeness conservation, which you know very well, uh, uh, the, the complementary production of K plus, K minus, and lambdas, um, the K to pi appears as a byproduct. And it's explained in the thermal in the statistical model quite well. It's not as sharp as the NA49 data suggest, but uh, it is explained at least in a very good order, if not completely, yes. Yeah, I want to take this opportunity, Anton, you speak. Could you predict or not predict because this is at the fits, but could you somehow interpolate if your fits uh, uh, show dependencies for argon scandium and beryllium? Um, yes, in principle, we should in terms of ratios and should now uh, take care a bit uh, in second order, the strangeness conservation, the uh, strangeness canonical should play a role as well. So I think this is why it is not so straightforward, although conceptually- Yeah, but you know, we try to do it before measurements and then we are on strangest conservation doesn't play any role. <laughs> it's such a huge amount of chaos, right? 
and, and, and stage particles in general. And beryllium, it starts to play by a little bit. So this is why we were pretty shocked that argon is, is, is down. Okay, good. I mean, it is, so, if the strangeness canonical does not play any role, then we predict the same ratio in lighter and medium systems compared to lead lead. Right, and then somehow we are part, there is a puzzle. Yeah. Okay, so there uh, we can discuss it further tomorrow. I encourage both of you to, uh, you know, bring it forward in the discussion section tomorrow. And for now, uh, we have to move on. Thank you very much, Marek, again for the overview. Thank you. And uh, the last speaker of this session would be Kojiro Osawa uh, from Keck online. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. can you hear me? Yes, very good. Just a moment. Oh, do you see my slides? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So let's start. So thank you for <coughs> inviting me to such an uh, interesting workshop. So next time I would like to uh, go to Trent uh, in person and also attend the workshop. <laughs> but now, so I'm online and I'm from Japan. Okay. So uh, today, so I'd like to talk about JPAC heavy ion overview. So I'm, uh, my name is Kyoichi Rozawa. I'm from KK. So uh, this is an outlook, uh, outline of uh, my talk. So first, I'd like to show uh, recent activities at J Park. Oh, just a moment. Yeah. So recently, I uh, we have started the experiment to measure vector meson mass spectra in nucleus. So this is related to the chiral symmetry restoration in finite density matter. And we are planning to have an uh, experiment to study uh, the correlation in charmed variants. So I will, I will briefly show about the status of this experiment. And then I would like to talk about the JPAC heavy ion program. So uh, current uh, accelerator and detector plan. And also we are planning to have staging approach so I will show some uh, some uh, some plants about this staging approach. Okay, okay so of course, so we are interested in the uh, finite density matter and the study of finite density matter uh, in this region. So at JPAC, so several studies related to finite density media are ongoing. So this is a uh, JPAC. JPAC stands for JPAC Proton Accelerator Research Complex. So we have three accelerators, so which is uh, located near seashore. So this is a uh, Pacific Ocean. So uh, 400 MeV Linux and the RCS 3GB synchrotron and the 30 GB main synchrotron. So we have two experimental facility, a neutron facility and a hadron experimental facility. So neutron facility is already <laughs> pointed out by uh, Professor Marek. And so uh, this is hadron experimental facility. So this uh, facility is uh, for hadron experiment and the heavy ion experiment. So this is a schematic view of hardware experimental facility. So we have the GB main ring and there is an extraction point from uh, main ring to the hardware experimental facility. And we have long uh, transfer beam line, uh, which is about 200 meters. And we have experimental fall. So mainly so we have generated uh, secondary beams to have uh, nuclear and particle physics experiment. So countries, so we have three beam lines, K1.A and K1.APR. Okay, 
And so we have a uh, neutral K method B line for CP violation experiment. And recently, we have constructed a new primary beam line here. And we have started the experiment uh, for vector meson measurement. Okay. So I'd like to show current JPEG activities. So first uh, experiment is for vector meson in nucleus. So spectral changes of vector meson in QCD media provide crucial information on the non-trivial structure of QCD media. So it is related to the spontaneous breaking, broken color symmetry and its partial restoration. So this is an upgrade of the KK PS E325 experiment. So at KK, so we have measured uh, E plus E mass, mass spectrum like this. And we, we uh, see some enhancement in the light uh, mass region of the five methods. So to confirm this result and uh, to have uh, further studies, so we direct to have higher statistics and better resolution at JPART. So at JPART, so we expect this kind of X, uh, spectra. So at JPEX, we are performing a new experiment. It is called JPEX E60 experiment. So uh, this experiment aims to measure E plus E minus uh, invariant mass spectra uh, in new graphs. So we have 10 times larger statistics compared to the KK experiment. So we have 10 times higher than KK. So uh, uh, K higher than KK uh, beam intensity and two times better resolution than KK. So uh, in, in the spectrometer, so we have tracking devices such as silicon strip detector and three layers of gem trackers. And we have electro identification counters uh, such as hadron brine detector and red glass calorimeter. So now, so uh, this is the status of the experiment. So we have the first beam in the last year, and we have commissioning runs uh, the last year and this year. So all detectors, uh, triggers, and the AQ work well. So our pilot data were taken. So we are planning to have uh, physics data acquisition in December 2022. So actually, so at this moment, so JPEG has a long shutter. So the next beam time is like December 2022. So this is a photograph for the spectrometer, and this is some online plot of electron identification detectors and also tracking devices. Okay. So uh, next uh, next experiment is a uh, study of dichroic correlation and charmed barium. So dichroic correlation can have a, an important role in the finite density matter. So such, for example, so called condenses for color superconducting uh, media. So to study this correlation. So charmed barium have unique inter, uh, internal structure and are suitable to study co-correlations. So we are measuring the excitation state of this charmed barium. So this excitation state of charmed barium can be identified as a dichroic motion, this, uh, this excitation, or a single charm coke motion. Uh, OK. Uh, yeah, so measurement of excitation states of charmed barium are important. So new experiment is proposed to measure the excitation states using a missing mass method. So, now, so physics importance of the experiment is already approved and we are preparing this experiment. 
So proposed experiment is following. So we have a primary beam and a proton target, and we measure the star uh, or outgoing the star and to calculate the missing mass or uh, the mass of excited state. So we use the missing mass technique to identify child value mass. And we also measure decay product uh, to obtain further information. And we, we will expect it, such kind of spectrum. So we can see this kind of uh, excited state and this energy, uh, excited energy can show the uh, information of the correlation. Okay. okay, so next, so I'd like to talk about the heavy ion project. So uh, this is a heavy ion acceleration scheme at J Park. So currently, so we have heavy, uh, Proton uh, Linux and the uh, uh, GB rapid cycle synchrotron and the main synchrotron. So, in addition to this existing uh, accelerator, so we need these two, two uh, accelerators. So, heavy on Linux and heavy on booster ring. So then <clears throat> we, uh, we we will get the heavy on beam at rate of uh, 10 to the 11 hertz. And so energy is uh, one to the 12 AGB. So uh, heavy ion is uh, injected to the uh, RCS and uh, accelerated to 735 MeV and go uh, transfer to main ring and we got uh, this uh, almost 12 AGB. And so this is extracted to the an experimental facility and we have uh, experiment. So also, so we need an upgrade of the experimental facility because we have very limited space for the experiment. So this is, uh, this is an uh, upgrade from of the experimental four. So this is a, this is a uh, current experimental four and we have an upgrade from of the uh, extension plan of the experimental four. And we are planning to have an X for JPAC heavy ion experiment. And we need to construct a, a new spectrometer to <coughs> have an uh, experiment. So a uh, high intensity beam is available at, by, at J Park. So we need to cope with this high intensity beam. And also we are planning to have a large acceptance and low PT tracking detector. So with much eventual event selective, I'm selectivity aiming at precise precision measurements of fluctuation, direct on sound hadron. And so detector concepts are still under discussion. And uh, actually, so the energy range is uh, exactly the same as 600. So and, uh, it should be a complement uh, design uh, to fair CVM uh, detectors from physics point of view. So we are uh, still discussing about the detector concept. But at this moment, so we have three configurations up, uh, as a planning. So hadron spectrometer and dimuon spectrometer and the hypernucleate spectrometer for close configuration. So like this. Okay. So we are uh, still working for evaluating the uh, performance of the uh, uh, new spectrometer. So 
we have evaluated the performance of our dimension spectrometer using the uh, jam uh, event generator and the simulation. So reconstruct track passing through uh, whole lambda i uh, mu observers. And so the uh, obtained spectrum is like this. So this is generated character uh, plot, and this is obtained by reconstructed spectrum. So even at uh, the low mass region, so we have enough resolution. And so we are uh, discussing uh, with theorists uh, to develop a further for observer box. So for example, so calculation for summarized phase uh, be, being developed by a collaboration of theoretical groups. So this is an example, uh, job, example of calculation uh, by a Japanese group uh, using the unified hydro cascade model. So simultaneously evolve both fluid element and hadron in time. So high density hadron is a part of fluid and cruise part of fluid is hadron cascades. So this unified model describes uh, data well and why uh, cascade only doesn't. So it seems we can expect a part of free phase even at the JPAC energy. And so using this model, so we are evaluating the uh, significance of flow measurement uh, at, uh, with our detector. So we generate a gold gold event using this model, and we evaluate the high order flow uh, like, uh, like this. So this is like a v, v2, v3, and v4 as a function of pt. So uh, we have significant, uh, we can expect significant uh, uh, signal for uh, these flows. And also we are uh, evaluating the higher of the harmonics with equivalent method like this. Okay, so both uh, has a uh, significant uh, signals. Okay, so, uh, so <coughs> we only need uh, inject and booster and uh, experimental area, so at the spectrometer. So, but so still, so it is hard to realize them in a reasonable time scale. And so we are discussing a staging approach. So first, so we like to have minimum upgrade and then uh, full upgrade. So as a minimum upgrade for accelerator part, so we will have a uh, heavy on lineup and uh, the use of uh, KKPS booster ring. So for this plan, so the uh, required budget is uh, very uh, reduced. <laughs> But so intensity is limited by KK BS this booster ring, so which is a small ring and no flexibility of optics. So stage charge effect is at the, uh, uh, but so we have uh, 10 to the minus three, minus third uh, lower uh, intensity is assumed. So then space charge effect is uh, the negligible level. So using this scheme, so we can expect only the 10 to the eight uh, uh, hertz as an intensity. But so uh, we are thinking uh, it is important to start heavier in physics at the JPAC, even <coughs> using the uh, small intensity. And so we are planning to have an experiment with existing E plus E spectrometer. 
So this spectrometer is used uh, for the currently used for uh, vector method measurement. So this is a direct uh, measurement spectrometer, and uh, we are planning to have direct measurement in heavy ion collisions at JPAC with uh, some, a small upgrade of uh, E16 spectrometer. But uh, as I said, so we only expect 10 to the eight beams. But so this, uh, using this uh, lower density, so we can use the experimental area as it is. So we don't need additional uh, radiation shield. So this is a good point. So then, so in this July, so we submitted the first proposal for uh, the heavy experiment uh, using this uh, detector. So in this proposal, so we are planning to measure the uh, temperature and yield uh, of direct electrons above uh, 1 GeV. So uh, physics is a search for searching for uh, onset of patronic matter in this region. So we uh, we are planning to measure uh, E plus E minus invariant mass, uh, invariant mass spectrum, and extract the uh, slope parameter and uh, have an energy scan. So then we can have uh, such kind of uh, caloric curve on this plot. So to have this experiment, so we there is a uh, required upgrade of the uh, spectrometer. So the most for the modules should be up upgraded to cope with a high heat multiplicity in environment. So heat occupancy should be reduced, and the finer segments are required. So th then, so this purpose. For this purpose, we need to replace uh, some tracking devices, such as a most in a gem tracker, uh, which uh, should be uh, replaced by uh, silicon, track, silicon detectors. And also, we need to replace retrogress calorimeter. So retrogress calorimeter must be upgraded to finer segment detectors, uh, for example, so red tanks. And also, uh, also, so we need a zero degree parameter. So in PA collision, so we don't need such kind of detector, but so in PAA collision, so we need this kind of detector to, uh, to determine centrality. And also, <laughs> we need to upgrade leader than DAQ system. So current system assumes uh, one kilohertz of event trigger but the new system should be run at 50 kilohertz interactions. Okay. Okay, so and this expected mass distribution uh, using the uh, upgrade uh, E16 spectrometer. So six pass acceleration of T can be expected in this region in case of uh, 150 MeV. Uh, Temperature and temperature and accuracy of T can be expected in this region for 120 MeV temperature. And 20% accuracy should be integrated excess yield in this low mass region. So, using uh, upgraded uh, spectrometer, so we can expect the significant physics result. Okay, so let, I'd like to summarize my talk and I'd like to say something about the outlook. So several studies related with finite density matter is ongoing at JPRAC, so vector meson in nucleus and the cooperation in charmed variants. So future heavy program at JPRAC is being prepared. So we need a uh, LINAC and booster for heavy acceleration. So staging approaches under discussion. First, we can start with minimum upgrade based on existing accelerator equipment and direct spectrometer. 
So then we are planning to have full upgrade. So, but so outlook is following. So, good news. So, we uh, submitted a uh, proposal to the PAC. So, the JPAC heavy iron project is scheduled on the JPAC calendar. So, it's a, it's a very good news. But so, under the current budget situation, so even the minimum upgrade, so will be uh, completed in 2009. So <laughs> this is, I think this is bad. <laughs> so still, so we are uh, seriously uh, discussing about the schedule and the detector plans. So a uh, detailed detector congregation for the final de uh, design uh, is under discussion and will be determined in, in a year. So your comments are very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Right. Any uh, questions? Axel? I think we can hand over the microphone because we have the camera to the audience. But the microphone doesn't work. That oh, doesn't work. No. You, you have your, you have your six. What is the end of somebody has a microphone? Okay. Can you go back to slide 22? 22. This overview of the JPAC program. Uh, this is more of a comment, and it's actually not only to you, but also to Christoph, who showed the same plot earlier. Um, mm -hmm. That is sort of the the source temperature versus the the square root s. Um, I mean, these are wonderful measurements, and you know, great future measurements. But I think we need to be a little bit cautious with in, with the interpretation of that, because the source is not a static source. And therefore, in different mass regions, at different square root s, different time periods during the collision contribute, right? So I mentioned that because yeah, yeah. already comparing Hades and NA60 might not be completely straightforward <laughs> in this context. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So totally agree. With you. So so I think so. It is important to have some uh, uh, some some uh, time developing uh, theoretical model calculation to understand uh, what is going on in the collisions. So, and so, so to combine all uh, information, so we can uh, produce such kind of uh, plot, as you pointed out. Yeah, thank you. 60 points, of course, you go to the intermediate mass region where you are biased by the early uh, emission. It's really a competition, as we all know, between volume uh, emission and um, temperature enhancement. So uh, NA6 is shown if you go to, you know, if the temperatures are uh, 200 MeV in the system and, uh, you know, you go to the intermediate mass region, you're picking up mostly the thermal emission. And so hard is basically you cut down uh, the temperature by factor two. Um, <laughs> you go to half the mass. More or less, not exactly. That's essentially what is going on because the hardest slope is the, the slope in the 6700 MeV region, ah. at 67, while the NA60 slope is in the you know 200, factor two to three. But this is roughly reflected in the in the mass ranges that NA60 points measured and the hardest points measured. So so that balance uh, should, ah. should actually roughly work out. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, this is yeah, a, yeah, a yeah. caveat. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, <laughs> I will think about it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
Federico, please, please, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm not very familiar with, with your program, sorry, so maybe the question is, uh, is a bit silly, but uh, I see that you can reach very high beam intensity with the protons already now uh, oh, or uh, in, in uh, let's say, one year uh, from now. So uh, we had this discussion before uh, about subthreshold production in proton nucleus. Uh, uh, it may look like that this uh, could be reachable with, uh, with this facility. Because oh, yeah. you arrive, uh, let's say, the energy yeah, is still yeah. subthreshold for the charm, but but not yeah. too subthreshold. Yeah, yeah. Actually, so we have an intensity of 10 to the 10, 20, 10 hertz. So it's uh, uh, it's already high intensity. And so, of course, we can uh, measure uh, uh, the website uh, in uh, subthreshold sub region. But so the one issue is uh, acceptance, acceptance of the uh, spectrometer. So we uh, are aiming to measure uh, uh, low mass vector meson in nucleus. So uh, which means so we are uh, measuring slowly moving uh, uh, low mass vector mesons. So it means so the opening angle of E plus E minus very large. So we uh, we our acceptance is in uh, backward region in CM system. So for JPSI measurements, so it is very limited. So I think the uh, statistics for JPSI is. Uh, uh, at least less than a CBM case, okay. But, but so, uh, still, so we can measure, okay. Yeah. Um, issue um, for people here on site and that's uh, transportation to the, I guess, downtown uh, dinner venue. No, it, it could be here in, in the villa. The, oh, the, so the transportation uh, afterwards. Um, People still have to get back uh, down uh, downtown, right? After the dinner, then. We, we have a number of cars. Uh, yes, so we should figure out we should figure out how many uh, seats we still need for taxis that uh, Barbara would then order. Okay. Okay. How many cars do we have Five, you are, you are feeling it, so okay. Five, four people. Mm -hmm. So we are here twenty, and uh, so we have uh, four times five is twenty. Yeah. Okay. Five, 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 five. Seems okay. Yeah. Seems okay. Here twenty. Yeah. Seems okay. 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 Good. Yes. All right. So thank you very much for your talk. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I uh, close the session, and I'd say we come back at fifteen after five fifteen uh, Central European time. Yep. Okay.